Welcome to the February 2nd meeting of the Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board of Education. Uh, Superintendent, will you take the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Clark? Uh, uh, here. Mr. Huey? Here. Ms. Lorette? Here. Ms. Lofthouse? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will be going into a uh, closed session uh, on the following matters, uh, student matters, uh, employer-employee relations, conference with legal counsel regarding litigation, conference with real property negotiators, and personnel matters. But before we um, recess uh, to closed session, is there any public comment on closed session agenda items? Anybody online? No. All right. Uh, then we will adjourn till 6 p.m. sharp. We will be back uh, for open session. We are in recess. Welcome to the February 2nd meeting of the Folsom Court of a Unified School District uh, Board of Education. Uh, if you will, uh, please stand with me uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, broadcast statement. A broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. The meeting is being live streamed on the district's YouTube channel. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat st staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, and or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Public comments during board meetings are an important component of public engagement and transparency. Um, this is a new part of the, uh, of the uh, broadcast statement. So um, members of the public will not be permitted to yield their speaking time to another member of the public. All written comments submitted by 3 p.m. today uh, to the board have been read. Per the Brown Act, the board is not allowed to enter into a two-way discussion on any matter not on the agenda. Uh, let's see. Uh, at the direction of the board, the superintendent will call roll, acknowledging the board received all electronic comments submitted as it pertains to today's board meeting. Superintendent, please call the roll. Ms. Perez? Here. Ms. Srivastav? Here. Mr. Clark? Here. Mr. Huey? Here. Ms. Lorette? Here. Ms. Lofthouse? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and that takes us uh, to agenda item five, reporting out of closed session. Superintendent? We have no action to report out of closed session tonight, Mr. Reed. Thank you. Uh, next item is adoption of the agenda. Is there a motion? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? I'll second. A second uh, by Ms. Lofthouse, uh, Superintendent, if you'll take uh, the roll. Yes. Ms. Perez? Aye. Mr. Ivastov? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Lorette? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. All right. That takes us to agenda item 7, special presentations. Uh, Superintendent. Yes, it's my honor to uh, introduce our students who are presenting Connections from Kenny High School. And I'm going to ask uh, Principal Alan Sims to come forward. And he and Vice Principal Suzanne Borth are going to share a wonderful presentation alongside students from Kenny High School. <coughs> So welcome. Thank you. Hello. This is Alan Sins. Hi. I'm Suzanne Borth. We are uh, really proud to be joined here today by our teacher, Faye Pachonas, our science teacher and leadership team. And three members of our leadership class, Tara Powell, Michael Ramirez and Gabriel Meyer. The two, on, uh, and the last two are on our now winning basketball team. 
So just hey. want to make sure that was out there as well. A uh, couple others worked hard on this presentation with us, but due to family obligations and illness, weren't able to be here, but I'm sure you will see them around because they are movers and shakers. <laughs> All right, Kenny is one of uh, Folsom Cordova Unified School District's continuation high schools. Uh, what makes us different is that we are a place where students can recover lost credits in order to graduate from there or go back to their comprehensive site, but it is so much more, and I'll let you hear from our students. We made a video. <laughs> <laughs> treat us like students they treat us like a family and there's different resources here for anybody going through anything so like we're never alone at this school here at Kenny Leto class is fun and creative because it prepares us for upcoming careers and jobs nice school cool people Simple as that. Teachers care about you, personal attention, all that. It helps me get my credits up that I miss at Grover. And it helps me also, like, with real life situations, like for um, when I get mad or just sad, I know how to cope with it. That's why I like Kenny, because it helps you more than any other high school. I like Kenny because of the warm, welcoming environment and the love the teachers have and the smaller classes. Gotcha. Kenny is a good school for if you want to get your credits up and graduate early and it's also not a very populated school so you probably won't get distracted as easily and have, there's not no drama here so you don't have to worry about that and yeah i'm very happy as a mom that my son can go to kinney he loves welding he loves being able to play basketball and be in a small atmosphere with people that feel like a family I like Kenny because um, it has nice people there. Uh, everybody um, can get treated equal, and Kenny is like home. Kinney High School is a school where you can walk on campus and not have an anxious feeling of dread. You know you will be greeted at the door with a warm welcome and, su and be supported throughout the day. You will attend each class and learn about everything you were learning at Cordova High, but with more personal support. We are a family at Kenny and hold each other with accountable. We are here to make up our credits, work on our skills, and prepare either to return to Cordova or graduate into a career or college. So we worked very hard to build a space where students can recover their confidence and restore a positive relationship with the institution at school, but we can do more. So we have a list of hopes and goals that we wanted to share and the youth agreed with this. We've been working on this as a community. We are WASC accredited and we'd like to offer more A to G courses for students hoping to return to comprehensive sites and on to university. Uh, full in-person PE by adding maybe a track and field. We are in the process of having co-teaching with the goal of full inclusion for our students with IEPs and emerging bilingual and trilingual <coughs> students. Our friend um, Harapi um, really wanted to do her presentation in English and um, 
um, got a little scared at the last minute. So we figured it showed the inclusiveness we're going for by including her in Armenian. We'd like to get a dedicated restorative space for emotional recovery to offer to our groups and our community circles. We want more community partners to offer on campus, such as health and mental health supports. Um, we got a lot of help from the district recently getting our basketball team sports physicals at the last minute. And we don't want our families to have to race around like that. And a space for sporting events, graduation assemblies um, for our growing population, because it's important that our families are connected to our school. Um, what do you want to know about Kenny? Any questions? Um, ask us students and we'll be able to answer to the best of our abilities. Mr. Clark? Uh, you mentioned uh, graduation and, and I've been to quite a few and it's usually 150 degrees out there, but um, <laughs> is it possible to maybe use one of the middle schools? Like, because I think Walnut Wood at one year had commandeered the, uh, I think it was Mills, no, Mitchell. So is it possible to, you know, since you know when your graduation date is, maybe schedule it for that? Absolutely, we have. Um, it was during COVID, it was, we shifted back and doing the drive-throughs and um, it was our students who really drove the decision to come back to our campus with, mm -hmm. our, with our families. Um, we even have worked with Cordova High setting up to where we can use their, their, their theater room. Right. for the graduation as well. So we have several options, um, okay. but we kind of leave it up to our student body to decide where they want to hold their graduation. Well, you got to find some shade though, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. We figured it out. We found the shade. We figured oh, oh, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. I would just like to say thank you guys for coming out and presenting and sharing what you have on campus. Uh, I look forward to coming out to visit I know it is a little bit nerve wracking to stand up at the podium and present. So thank you and I appreciate it. Um, I also just wanted to say thank you guys for coming out and presenting. I have heard amazing things about Kinney and I was just wondering if you guys have any after school clubs or any extracurriculars that are student led? Student led, um, we have a couple activities and after school clubs. Um, we have a, a travel club a basketball club, a leadership club for those who may not be able to fit leadership into their schedule, they can come in after school and offer to help with the school. We have cooking club, we have art club, um, sewing, club. sewing club, graduation club gardening, club, gardening club. We have a lot of options and we love to hear from our students whether they would like more activities and we try our best to give them what they need. That's awesome, thank you. make sure this is on I was there last week and I think you had to take the boys to a basketball game is there a reason why it's in the middle of the day and and not during the afternoon that was just the way the league is is set up that we're a part of oh really okay all right and then you guys are playing at community centers obviously okay all awesome. the games are at the George Sims Center oh all right great what's your record three and one good deal all right <laughs> Yes, I'd like to also thank our students um, for being here and, and being um, involved in Kinney High School and really being the voice of the students and your participation in the video. Please let Harapi know. I appreciated her comments in Armenian. She said how much you love the school. And uh, I understood it when she said it when I watched the video, but I wanted everyone else to know that uh, she really is connected to. And I think that just speaks to the inclusivity, inclusivity that Kinney High School, the staff, um, all staff um, create that environment for our students. So uh, kudos to the team and that culture of opening doors and welcoming students. Thank you. Can I make a quick comment as well, please? Um, thank you. It's actually a question. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Kinney a couple months ago as well, um, and I definitely felt like the family environment um, that was mentioned in the video. Um, but I'd love to hear about your guys' experience. Are all three of you in leadership? That's great. I'd love to hear about your guys' experience in leadership, if you would be willing to like elaborate a little bit on that. So for leadership, we like to 
put together activities for the students to have them maybe do something new on a half day. We do do some holidays like for Christmas, we had put together a bunch of different holidays for different cultures. We had did Hanukkah. Um, what else did we do? We did Diwali, Diwali um, Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Just we put together a bunch of different holidays so that way everyone felt safe and at home with the school and everything. Um, we're also doing candy grams for Valentine's Day coming up. Um, what else do we have planned? Blood drive. We have blood drive coming up very soon. Um, you were new student community circles. Oh yes, we are currently working on new student community circles, which is where we bring in all the new students and welcome them in. Have them ask us any questions that they have. We get them the round of, like let them know what's happening at the school, what kind of clubs are available for them, what kind of help is around. Just let them know that you know we're a family at Kinney and we're always here to help. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your guys' service. And hopefully we'll have a Kinney High student board member pretty soon. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Laura. Um, yeah, I just want to make a quick comment, too. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I really liked about your presentation that I kept hearing over and over again was that it felt like home. And so I want to commend you for that feeling and environment that you guys are creating there. And the other thing I'm kind of sounding like you guys need is more like collective space for you guys to be able to kind of come together as a group is kind of what you're lacking over there. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, we do need some more space for more activities and more just general area for the kids to be able to express themselves. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Of course. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. That takes us to agenda item eight, which is public comment. Uh, this is the, uh, the period in the agenda where anybody who wants to speak on any topic not associated with another specific agenda item uh, can speak uh, to the board. Um, I will highlight uh, and provide an explanation, as I had mentioned at the beginning during the um, a broadcast statement that we uh, were no longer going to permit uh, individuals to yield their speaking time to another member of the public. Um, that uh, came about uh, during our special session in uh, uh, January. We had legal counsel and that issue had come up and we asked legal counsel if that was appropriate and legal counsel basically said it wasn't. Um, we should not be allowing folks to cede our time. It's been something that we've done, um, I don't know how, well, I would say somewhat consistently. So uh, because of that, we uh, uh, changed uh, the way we're, we're approaching that. Uh, we did make an announcement at the last meeting that we were going to be doing that, and it's also included on a future agenda, or on an agenda item later in the agenda uh, regarding the governance handbook. It's in there as well. But I just, I just wanted to provide an explanation in case anybody was wondering why that um, change was made. So uh, that, let's see here. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Rebecca Mott. Welcome. Um, good evening. I've never done this before, so I'm nervous, but I know that I what I do for the school district is I work at Meadows as an IA at, in the autistic um, kindergarten and first grade class. I know that one, we're uh, wanting to cut down uh, kindergarten to half day like it was before. And with my experience, um, our children cannot last that long. Um, the rest of the day, we work from probably from nine to probably noon and after that, we have a couple kids that take naps, and then we also have kids that just can't handle it, so we just play for the rest of the day. So um, I guess I am just letting you know that this is our situation, and the teacher and I would like to vote yes, or however it's going, that um, it would, that, that is a situation that we're dealing with in our autistic class at Meadows. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, the next speaker is uh, Julie Thompson. And um, uh, Jeanette Sansenbach will be following Julie. Thank you Welcome. for your time and your service to our district. I've also never gotten up on at, at this spot. I've spoken virtually, but here we are. Um, I teach kindergarten. I've taught kindergarten and love it for many years in the district. Taught a uh, slip session, loved it. I teach, I've taught early, late before I'm teaching it again. And next year we'll be going full day. Right now, for two of the three and a half hours of our half day, we are at a 12 to 1 ratio, which is just over 50% of our day. We're at a 12 to 1 ratio for student to teacher ratio. Next year, as we go to a 66 hour day, six hour plus day, I'd like to make sure that we still get that ratio of 12 to 1. So we have, we won't have two credentialed teachers in the classroom during that time, but I do request that you consider making sure that we have an instructional assistant, a paraprofessional, who's not just there sporadically, which is what's going on this year, I've heard, in the full day kindergartens. Um, it's, there's not a really consistent um, paraprofessional situation. Uh, there might be a, a BIA who's helping, there might be an instructional assistant, but I think what's important is the consistency in the classroom for those students um, who are learning their foundation, foundational skills. If you can consider having 20 kids at your home or anywhere for even an hour, um, not, not to mention six hours where you're trying to teach these kids to read and write and get along and do math, um, it's really important that they have consistency and trained, um, trained instructors. Um, Kindergartners, unlike even first graders, are not independent. We've got many mainstreamed kids in our class. Um, the longer day is very, very tiring, and uh, my time is up. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jeanette Sansenbach, uh, followed by uh, Angela Edwards. Good evening. Um, I'm Jeanette Sansenbach from fourth grade at Santa J. Gallardo, uh, recipient of this year's California Singlish Schools. I'm back again um, to question a district decision without notice to teachers and consideration to students. Um, the decision that I'm here to question is what educational value does taking the CASP testing early have? As a planner, every year during the summertime, I has scope and sequence all of our core subjects as much as possible, and then as I plan and get better acquainted with my students, I adjust that schedule, especially in math. Historically, fourth grade at Santa J. Gallardo has pushed the testing back as far as we can in order to go ahead and cover as much of the curriculum as possible without doubling up on math lessons and focusing on key concepts in both ELA and math. As you can imagine, this takes hours, um, and not only during my summertime, but also throughout the year. Two weeks ago, the intermediate staff was told that testing department that the testing department and the CNI team made the determination that we were supposed to conclude testing before we go on spring break. And our test coordinator is pushing that back a week earlier um, as to make sure all tests started before spring break are finished so that time does not expire on time constraint tests because there are two, one in each area. I know this doesn't seem like a huge jump, but a couple of weeks, but a couple of weeks, but it causes students not to be exposed to one or two units of knowledge, geometry. This particular subject is historically within our district and at our school to be the <laughs> historically the lowest area in math. Because most of our schools either try to teach it while they're teaching other concepts or don't reach it at all. Um, at Gallardo, we pride ourselves on exposing our students to as much content as possible before state testing and our scores prove it. The reason given to us was the teachers is for equality. So the schools that within our district can be compared because everyone is taking the test approximately the same time, which is not guaranteed because the vast window given. I don't understand why this is the one test that is being compared. Please <coughs> consider telling the SNI team to reconsider their position. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, yes. um, if I may, in the past we have had three minutes uh, for a conversation. I know I notice now it's two. Is that changed, or can we go back to the way we were with three? Uh, we can, well, 
Uh, we have, uh, we've been at two for a while. Um, <coughs> we can go to three, but the, uh, probably it would have been better if we did that at the beginning of the meeting so we didn't deprive the individuals who've already spoken. Yeah, that I, I just noticed that it was two minutes and it's like, I thought. It's going fast. I know. <laughs> um, so, okay. No. Well, does the board, would, would you like to go to three minutes? I think we, for the past year or so, we've been at two other yeah. than uh, students speaking, in which case we give three minutes. Right. So I, I would say we stay consistent with what we've had. Okay. Right. Uh, so uh, Angela Edwards followed by uh, Lorette uh, Gaberman. Hi, I'm a first grade teacher at Williamson Elementary School. This is my 29th year being a teacher. Um, toward the end of the 2020 school year, when we were dealing with COVID, I remember, remember hearing that the board was considering doing away with the early late program. I had a conversation with Ms. Carla Magno, who was our principal at the time, about what a horrible idea that was because of how vol valuable that time was, um, the early late program, being able to teach small groups. During the year of COVID, I had 12 students at a time for two and a half hours that year. It was incredible how much curriculum I could go through and how much attention I was able to give to those students. At least three of my students didn't know the letters and sounds by the end of the year they were reading early chapter books and writing stories. I couldn't believe that the board was considering taking away the early late program and that precious time that I have with my kids. I'm not sure how you come to your decisions, but the only bo board member that I've seen on campus is Mr. Clark. Thank you for visiting our school often. I appreciated, uh, Mr. Reed, that you had a virtual meeting uh, with the teachers to discuss the early late program and how effective it is. All the teachers at the meeting shared their expertise and were in favor of keeping the program as it allowed good, quiet quality instruction. Only one teacher showed up to, um, show support for full day and she showed up late. She could have, probably could have benefited from an early late program. <laughs> <laughs> our expertise was ignored and our students and teachers are now paying the price with that being gone. So I'd love to hear reasoning someday why that was taken um, away from us. Students struggle to make it to the end of a six and a half hour day. We have so many behavior problems that take away from teaching besides students who fall asleep or who are hungry before the end of the day. I invite you to spend the whole day with us so you can see how exhausted all staff is and how overwhelmed and burned out we're getting. I'm gonna cut it short now. Parents, the board works for you. It seems they listen to our parents and what parents want for their children. So please tell them that you demand quality aids to help out in the classroom, an aid that understands and can teach the provided lessons that the teacher has taken time to create to help students, an aid that won't be pulled out of the classroom to help out with translations or to do our duty on a rainy day, and aids should be left alone to do the job with their students. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lorette Gaberman followed by uh, uh, Kayla Kep Kepler. Good evening, everybody. This is Lorette Gaberman. Um, I am a third grade teacher, and you might wonder why I'm here supporting K2. Um, basically, it's because anything that happens in the lower grades directly affects the upper grades. And whatever we do in intermediate is going to affect middle school. What is happening um, in the lower grades is being witnessed by all of us. And so I wanna be here in support. I also should let you know that before the decades of um, time here with Folsom Cordova, um, I was a preschool director. I opened preschools. I was an early childhood education consultant for 72 schools. And I'm a guest lecturer for Sac State in early childhood development. The reason I bring that up is I feel I'm uniquely qualified to, to speak to this. The original idea behind Early Late was to keep up with Title 22. And for those of you not familiar with that, it is what we use for private schools. They keep a one to 12 ratio. Now, Early Late allowed a classroom of 24 students to keep up to that ratio for two hours a day. Why we would think we would get rid of that just boggles my mind as an all-time teacher. The age group's attention span we're talking about is very short. They may be here longer, 
but they're learning less because they tune out at a certain point. They just are too full. They can't do it. Um, their ability to stay awake is not there. They fall, they're falling asleep all over the place. And their ability to, ability to hold their pee is a big problem. <laughs> they're just babies from four to seven years old. Let's consider what we're doing to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Kayla Kepler, followed by uh, Nikki Freitas. Hi, so I'm really nervous, so I'm gonna talk really fast and I have a lot to say. But hello, Dr. Kligian and board members. My name is Kayla Kepler. I'm a proud parent of a kindergartner and a third grader, as well as a third grade teacher at Goldridge. Um, so I'm here to give you my perspective in support of, um, not in support, but for the support of the K2 um, people here. So picture yourself at your own child's fifth birthday. You invited 24 kids from their class. They all showed up and a couple of neighborhood kids. Can you imagine trying to get them all to sit down for a piece of cake, smile for a photo at the same time, and stand and wait in line as everyone's paying pin to tail on a donkey? It will be a nearly impossible task, even with half of their parents around for support. Now imagine you're a teacher trying to teach them not only to wait in line, but how to stay seated for story time or to be patient as their friends take turns. On top of that, you're having to teach them how to recognize letter sounds. There are 44. How to read 30 out of 38 sight words, which apparently is less than the number that they have to do by the first, first day of first grade. Now imagine having to have them recognize numbers, count, add, write a sentence. Basically, kindergarten is now the new first grade. Teachers need to consistent train support, not someone they have to train mid-lesson or that students don't know and don't have a relationship with. Teachers need to be able to have time and space to do small group so they are able to hear litter sounds and blends, which is nearly impossible to do with a class filled with 25, five to six year olds working independently around the classroom. <laughs> Next year, we'll, we'll be going from half day to full day where this will definitely help parents out with childhood or childcare cost, but the impact on their emotional well-being is nearly impossible. My children are both model students in the classroom, which I found out this week. They do not like to get in trouble, but at the end of the day in kindergarten, they were a mess, especially the first few weeks. They were able to hold it together in kindergarten, but thinking they can handle just because they handle daycare from seven to five every day is not the same at school. It's completely different. They're asked to be able to sit down in a little box and have, they've never done this before. So you're asking, it's like asking you to be sitting in a professional development class all day versus being at work all day. Now students still in February are emotionally drained and their stamina is something that teachers are worried about as we've heard before. Um, next year, kindergarten nearly doubles. As a third grade teacher, what I'm seeing is the trickle down effects and I know I'm going over but I'm just breaking the rules. Um, what, you, what doesn't get addressed in kindergarten will show up as a more of a deficit in first grade, second grade, and then third grade with me. I have two students that cannot read kindergarten sight words, and I have no idea what to do to help them. I am positive that if we don't address these concerns now that these teachers are pleading for, that the impacts in third grade will not only be compound, compounding then, but every single year through the um, community through high school. Can I encourage you to up? go, I know, sorry. I encourage you to go to these kindergarten classrooms halfway through the school year with support that they have and they're only half days. It's gonna be completely different next year in, in August. And I'm sorry, thank you. I just, I'm really uh, Nikki Freitas followed by Joanna Slaughter. By the way, I can tell that everybody's teachers because your writing is very legible. Oh, that's nice. Uh, thank you for the compliment, right, girls? <laughs> and gentlemen, if you're here. Okay, so my name is Nikki Freitas. Thank you for having me today. Um, Dr. Kligian, thank you so much for all you do. Hello. Nice to see you again. School board, thank you so much for all you do. Really. I see you. I appreciate you. Leaders of tomorrow, thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do. Um, teachers, super, super people, <laughs> administrators, legal people, because we're freaking out about everything. Um, I thank you, okay? I want to remind us all, I, I do, I really want to actually talk to these people. Could you 
these are really cute and all, but um, we really need to remember that we are who our community looks up to. We are. We are. They need us, okay? I'm telling you, I took medication to stay happy. I took depression medication to be a happier person so that I was never as depressed as everybody else so I can make people smile, okay? And I love to smile. Hi, give me some smiles. <laughs> hey, hi, hey. Okay. Um, I have a teenager who is not doing well. Her name's Katie. I love her dearly. High school at Vista was not for her. And uh, she's, she's hurt herself, like actually hurt herself. And she's now over at Options for Youth. It moves at her pace. And thank God for that. Because I don't know what I would do without the supports of a school that could work at her pace. And I do feel like our schools could have done that. But um, the thing is, is uh, she needed no time constraints. And I know I'm on a time thing, but I just want to tell you, this is a compliment to you guys and what you do for us as teachers. I want to thank you for our raise because we are all here a couple months ago asking for a raise and you heard us. You really did hear us and I actually want to thank you. Okay, do you see me looking into your eyes? I wanna thank you, okay, because that raise is what I needed to sustain my family. I now can be at home and take care of my daughter who needs me desperately right now. And I can actually go home after kindergarten and take care of her and make sure she's not hurting herself and make sure she's doing her homework and make sure she's not trying to steal money out of my bank account. I mean, or whatever it might be. Um, and so I just want you to know, I appreciate all you do. I really do. And I want us to remember that when we're doing something for this community, we are doing it for our future, for who we are, for what we want for our kids, for what we want when we are older and we can't lift a finger because we're too old and crippled and too much fat or whatever. Can, can you, you know, uh, please, please. Yeah, right. thank you. So um, I'm a kindergarten teacher. I just had a child today that just started school three days ago. He wouldn't come off of his, his, his mom. I had to take him from his mom and she gave me permission. He cried for the first half hour and I have 22 students. I had to tell the kids we're in emergency mode. I literally was holding him like a baby like this on my hip. Thank God I still remembered, you know, how to do that, right? Can, and, can you pl please wrap up? Yes. And so I'm here trying real hard to take care of this child and then still tell my children how to teach my children how to read and, or tell them to go and work at their table. So I just want you to know, if you haven't been in my room, come to kindergarten. The decisions you're making are so important to have the real life situation before you make the decision. And I'm gonna be happy and proud to be a kindergarten for a whole day, but I will be taking breaks. They will need a rest and I will do that. And I will, I will tell you how great it is in a couple of months, okay? Thank you. Um, but thank you so much for the raise. I really appreciate it. Um, and have a great rest of your year. Happy New Year, teachers. Uh, and join us, Slaughter. Um, hello, I teach kindergarten at Rancho Cordova Elementary. Before I share my experience with teaching a full-day kindergarten program this year, I would like to share a little bit about myself. I have been in the field of education for 23 years. 18 of those years have been in kindergarten. I have always worked at Title I schools. I have a master's degree. I'm national board certified fluently speak Spanish and have served in various leadership roles over the years. I share this with you to let you know I consider myself a highly effective teacher who understands the importance of a developmentally appropriate instructional program for our students. 
That being said, I thought you should hear from someone who is doing the work of educating students because that is why we are here. Our business is to provide the children a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Here are some things that are working well for me at my site in our all day program. That the first three weeks of school is early release days. All elementary classes at our site starting class at the same time having the last lunch time possible, PE and library time in the afternoon. Our intervention and academic coaches support us with an MTSS time. Some things that are a challenge and we can improve upon. Class size, we need a hard cap for our numbers. Smaller class size reduces noise, interruptions, and distractions for students. The smaller size would allow for even smaller small groups to happen throughout our day. It also allows teachers to really get to know each student individually and build relationships that are so important for social and emotional learning. Not enough prep time. Our day went from three hours and 17 minutes to six hours and 30 minutes. Our time doubled. My one hour of PE prep plus 15 minutes after school is not enough time. Our day is long. The students are tired. My suggestion is to have an earlier release time for kindergarten, a dismissal time of 2 or 2.15. This change would allow for more prep time for teachers and to my knowledge would not cost the district any more money. It is nearly impossible to read data, plan robust lessons, and provide a developmentally appropriate effective learning environment with such little prep time. My days usually begin at 7.15 a.m. and I am routinely at school until at least 5 p.m. Age support for small group instruction. Teachers need people. We need trained paraprofessionals to effectively run small group instruction. I ask you as you make your plans for next school year to invest in our students, invest in our students so that we can prepare them as to be successful as they can be in an all-day program. Thank you. Do we have anybody online? We do. We have one. Michelle. Welcome, Michelle. Michelle? Hi there. Hi there. It's yeah, Michelle Mays. Um, I wanted to thank you for allowing me to talk tonight, and I just wanted to echo what, um, what a lot of the teachers are sharing, that we are um, nervous about the all-day kindergarten schedule, and frankly, the first and second grade. I'm just sad that they've lost the early late, um, and I'm looking to next year going from an a.m. p.m. schedule to an all-day schedule, I am excited about having more time with my students. I do feel like our half day is very rushed and I'm trying to cram in all the great things. And um, so I do look forward to having a little bit more time. Uh, the length of the day, I do hear a lot of full-day teachers right now sharing their stories. And I am just concerned about the long day um, being too much for kindergartners and quite frankly, even first graders from what I'm hearing. Um, and so I do ask the board to um, make a decision about a shorter day for not even just kindergarten, but even maybe first and second. I mean, bring that early late back. <laughs> we are, um, a lot of us are doing the letters trainings. We're learning about small group instruction. And um, I have currently an awesome um, co-teacher and we run our differentiated groups right now, half day going from one teacher or two teachers right now to one teacher next year for um, all kindergarten students, and there's a soft cap of 24, which means I could potentially go up to 28 students. Uh, it does not make any sense. We're in the best interest to serve our students. Um, and I know that, um, you know, I'm a parent. I understand you want to send your student, you think, okay, they're going to be at school all day. You think they're getting the best quality instruction. However, parents, that is not going to happen. If you have one teacher with all those kids, Kids are going to get tired. We're not going to be able to provide small groups. Um, so please, um, board, when you're making your decisions, it doesn't cost you anything to give a shorter day for primary students. And to please give us the supports with extra uh, trained, qualified aides to help us with small groups. And please don't pull our intervention teachers for substitute. Thank you. All right. Um... That concludes, uh, no one else online? Okay. Uh, that concludes uh, public comment, and that takes us to agenda item nine, reports of district organizations. Uh, the first uh, student advisory board. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, so we had our monthly meeting for February yesterday. Um, we discussed the Community Schools Initiative in Rancho Cordova, um, and we got some really great feedback from our representatives, um, which we're hoping will influence that process. Um, we also participated in the LCAP data walkthrough, which was a really great opportunity for um, our representatives to interact with statistics ranging from suspension um, to absenteeism and much more. Um, and we also were able to get their feedback from that. Um, and we also want to remind students in our district, particularly the speakers of a language other than English, that the seal of biliteracy is open to them right now. Um, and it's a great opportunity to not only celebrate multilingualism, um, but boost your resume. Um, so for more information, please talk to your counselor about that. Um, and finally, we are working on making some changes to our SAB handbook, and we are looking forward to holding a district-wide election for student board members in this coming school year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that uh, takes us uh, to the California School Employees Association. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rob Korn. I'm the new CSEA 528 president. I'm taking over for Rob Thomas, who has done a lot of good things. Um, I work, I've worked for the district for about five years now. Um, I do heating and air and HVAC. Uh, in the maintenance department. First time speaking, a little nervous. <laughs> I look forward to building a relationship with all of you and hoping to build on what Rob and his team has structured. Um, nothing to report at this time. Welcome aboard, Rob. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the Folsom Cordova Education Association. Hey, I'm Christina Cook. I'm a first grade teacher at Mancini Ranch. I'm also an equity leader for the district, and I'm the human rights representative for FCEA. We're here today to give you a short presentation about full day K through two and a survey that we took late mid-December and of 143 responses that we got to that survey. So I'll introduce, um, we've got a team of people that are gonna be talking to you about full day K2. So do I have the clicker? Okay, thank you. So first of all, good evening board members and Dr. Kaligian. We're really happy to be here on, on behalf of FCEA. <laughs> survey results. We sent out a survey to all K through two teachers, including special ed, and we wanted to know what their current experience with classroom aids looks like <coughs> and any perks that they had with full day instruction and then also the challenges we called them glows and grows so challenges that they experienced with full day classroom instruction um, later on in i think next time that you have a board meeting you're going to be presented with all of the findings of the report so we're just going to give you like an overview of what what we found out with the results so current IA and paraprofessional help. Here's what's <coughs> happening in our classrooms right now. Instructional assistant and paraprofessionals in the classroom that help us, 51% of the teachers that we surveyed said they are getting sporadic or no time at all. That means no additional person in the classroom. 20, I have 24 students. I'm there all day, 8.15 to 2.45 with 24 students. I'm teaching all of my subjects just myself. 13% of the teachers said they were getting 30 minutes per day of support. 22% of the teachers said 30 to 60 minutes per day, and 14% of the teachers surveyed said they got 61 plus minutes per day. Lucky 14% to those teachers. Mm. So we are here to just go over some of the perks. We have heard before from some of the teachers that yes, being all day does offer some perks. In kindergarten, we said flexibility. We heard that flexibility was great. We can spend more time at centers, we can um, you know, take additional time to do social emotional learning. They didn't feel as rushed. They were able to bring in things that maybe they weren't able to do in just the AM PM schedule. And also they felt like they had more time for socializing and play. For grades one and two, again, flexibility for scheduling, not feeling as rushed, being able to teach additional subject lessons, including again, more time for social emotional needs. We're finding that kids post pandemic are definitely needing more social emotional support and um, having all day to do that really invites, you know, us to be able to spend more time doing that. So those are the perks of being all day. Let's go to the next one. And then we have the challenges. 
we have the challenges here. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what the challenges are. And then um, I'm going to invite kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and special ed teachers up to just go, go, go over specifically what they're seeing in the classroom. So I won't read these all to you, but you can see that kindergarten um, teachers have said that they lack um, small group classroom instruction time. They're going to be going from two credentialed teachers down to one. Behaviors escalate in the afternoon when kids get tired and everyone enters and leaves school at the same time, which causes anxiety. For grades one and two, again, no small group instruction time. We definitely need consistently scheduled paraeducators in the classroom with us for small group instructional training. And my big one here is that it's difficult, let's just say impossible to teach SIPs and letters and build relationships with our kiddos without having any small group um, time. And I think another teacher touched on this. Intervention teachers are continuously pulled from the classroom. My intervention teacher, who takes four of my students, three to four of my students, informed me that today is going to be my last day of her pulling any of my students because she's going to be pulled for doing CASP and LPAC testing. So I don't have a support anymore. For special ed, lacks small group instruction time again. We need IAs to meet student IEP goals. They've lost prep, lunchtime, and planning. The day's too long, behaviors escalate, pick up and drop off again for special ed kids um, is overwhelming. So you can see the challenges far outweigh the perks. So now I'm gonna um, have a kindergarten teacher, you've heard from her already, come up and share what she feels um, needs she needs for student success in her classroom and across the district being full day. We need people. Um, this. The previous slide before talked about behaviors. We're having lots of behaviors, and I hear it's everywhere. So more people, today an example, one of mine was not listening to an, a para that came to support him for 40 minutes. He was just not having it with her. Thankfully, I had her and a grown-up and half my class because some were MTSS. So I needed to let them take over the small group so I could keep that relationship and discipline him a little bit bring him back to, hey, this is how we do school. So let's calm down. Let's go run some laps. He and I did some laps today. And then we went back in and he was able to kind of continue. So we need that help so that I can do that. I can tag out for a minute or that person, you know, I can keep teaching and that person can take that student and, and help with them. So we really need people and we really need time to prep. I am prepping six different centers every day. And I am a highly educated, have lots and lots of stuff in my room. And I also mentor new teachers and I worry about them. They don't have the years of donors choose grants, building things in our classroom and games and knowing how to do small groups. And we're getting new teachers and they're coming and they're overwhelmed and their mental health and their physical health is a challenge because I talk to them, I mentor them. And they're like, you're stressed and you've been teaching 20 years okay, now I know that, I mean, it's not normal. We shouldn't be worried. So for us that are doing the work that I've talked to all day already, we need people and we need that prep time. So thanks. Go to first grade. So first grade needs, um, again, I'm Christina Cook, first grade teacher at Mangini. This is my 24th, 25th year with the district. I've only taught kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, so I would agree, we need trained paraprofessionals um, two hours a day if possible for small group, re small group reading instruction. Um, it, it, it is currently impossible to have a small group um, where you can hear them when you have 24 students in your classroom. Especially at Mangini Ranch, we're a brand new school. We have nice big classrooms, but attempting to hear five people at a small group with 19 to 20 other people milling around um, is impossible. I counted the last time I did um, small group instruction and I was interrupted 15 times. So I just said, that's it for today. We're, ca we're canceling small groups, 15 interruptions. And I want to help them, but I also want to teach them how to read. So we also need preferred scheduling for special instruction. That means we get our PE and library and MTSS time when it works for us. We really would like to continue the shortened day until Labor Day so that we can finish all of our assessments and build some relationships with our kids. Priority and scheduling with intervention teachers. 
meaning we don't get our intervention teachers pulled when there needs to be a substitute on campus or when we need her to do testing. And then we also would like time built into common planning time to meet with the paraprofessionals that we so greatly need. We would like to not build the plane while we're flying it and teach them how to lead a small group while we're actually leading a small group. I also wanted to say that I'm a proud parent of two kids that go to Folsom High who were lucky enough to have the early late program. And I think it really launched them into really great readers. Granted, they have a teacher at home with them too. But I think that the early late program was what set them off onto a course of loving to read. So let's keep going to second grade. So um, second grade needs are very similar to first grade needs. We, we said that we would like to also continue the shortened day, have paraprofessionals, time built into common planning time to meet with, with their paraprofessionals again. Second grade is just the, the building block. After you are from kindergarten, you go to first, you go to second. It doesn't mean that all second graders are reading. Many, many second graders still need phonics. They need sight words, they need support. When you have 25 students in your classroom, some of them are not knowing all their letters and sounds, and some of them are reading at fourth grade level. Imagine trying to meet those needs. Impossible. We work as hard as we can, but we're feeling like failures at this point. 25 years in the game, I'm feeling like a failure, and I'll admit that. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jessica Khan, and I've taught in the district a long time. Um, I don't remember how long. <laughs> and you'll see the needs are really very similar. We're talking about special education needs for some of our students who have very high needs. They're in a special day class for at least a portion of their day. And um, they we have wonderful paraprofessionals. And that's probably that some of those 14% are some of those classes because we do have that need to have classroom paraprofessionals. Right now, I teach a class that is kindergarten through fifth grade. So I've got every grade level in one room. It's a little one room schoolhouse. And my paraprofessionals are actually teaching small group, either one on one or in very small groups. I see Chris Clark nodding because he was there a couple weeks ago and got to see uh, our groups running. And um, the, the issue with that is we have to be able to train them. Um, as Christina just mentioned, you. It is really, really hard to have people constantly coming up and asking questions when they're first graders. It's just as hard when the paraprofessional keeps coming up and saying, how do I do this? How do I do that? They're not teachers, and I don't want to expect them to be, but I, have, I do rely on them to teach. So I need time to plan with them, and that is not built in at all. Um, there is a recommendation for continued shortened day, all those same things. We also don't always have instructional assistance during pickup and drop off. Um, and so we really need some extra support for that. And then the kinder day, especially for some of our students, they have other kinds of um, specialists that they work with after school and they are exhausted. They've done six hours um, and then they go home and maybe have ABA programs or some sort of program where they're still learning and they need that specialized instruction and they're completely wiped out by that point, parents are reporting. Um, I just wanna mention that the early drop off or pick up. We have students that I have students that come at 745 in the morning and um, I don't have any assistance during that time. So that means that I'm working with them starting at 840. I mean, 745. My contract actually doesn't start at that point, but I've got students who have specialized needs. They have to have a relationship with whoever they're working with and having them out on a yard with 400 kids is not a good idea. Trust me. So I think that's all I'll say on that. <laughs> Okay, in summary, we wanted to leave you with these four points, which we feel as K, one, two, and special ed teachers really are how we feel. A strong foundation in literacy begins with hearing and imitating sounds through play, song, and speaking. In first grade, um, we are also using letters and SIPs. Letters was funded by the district for teachers that wanted to take the training. I appreciate that. I have yet to run a successful letters group in first grade. Children learn to read so they can read to learn. We all know that. You have to learn how to read first, and then you can read to learn science and math, all of the things. Reading is the foundation for all future learning. We also believe that smaller groups help teachers to reach and teach all students. We want our students to feel seen, and we want them to feel supported. And then lastly, probably the most important, dollars that are invested in early literacy are far less than the dollars we will spend in the future to fill the gaps in learning. 
And in summary, I am Jamie Emmerich. I teach at Williamson first grade. I've been there 28 years. Um, I achieved my first national board in early childhood generally, early childhood generalist. Um, and then instead of renewing, I achieved a second national board in language and literacy. Um, I know a little bit about early childhood and a lot about literacy. I was recently on a flight and when the flight attendant reminded us, the passengers, if we were flying with young children in the event of emergency for the adults to put their oxygen mask on first, then tend to the children. My thoughts went right to my sweet struggling first grade class at Williamson this year. I thought about how important it is for teachers to take care of themselves first so that they are the best version of themselves for their students. I thought how important it is to be prepared for whatever might happen. Last year, our first and second grade task force was asked for a recommendation in regards to early late, a daily schedule enabling teachers to work with small groups of students without the extra need of support like a paraprofessional leaving that extra support, if any, for different needs throughout a first or second grade day. Our collective recommendation and pleas from educators based on our experience and knowledge was to maintain the status quo and keep early late. The board disregarded our efforts and there is no turning back that decision. So as the pilot of my own first grade plane for 28 years, this year has been extremely challenging without that small group time. I have support, an amazing paraprofessional I have trained myself to help my students. But due to illnesses, rainy days, translation needs, I have yet to get into a smooth working small group routine and we are over halfway through our year. Unfortunately, I'm not as effectively meeting the individual needs of my students as I once did in literacy and math. When you took early late away, I was disappointed, but the seasoned teacher I am took my knowledge and expertise and made the best of it, as I have done with each drastic and uninformed decision that has challenged my profession. The district offered some support for our transition to full day. For example, the teaching staff had an opportunity to sign up for a small group center training during the PD day prior to the start of the 22-23 school year. I led that session with the intent for our K-2 teachers to still effectively set up and run small group centers in their classrooms with or without an additional person. With step-by-step -step instructions and adequate training, teachers could still meet with small groups, implement the many strategies Letters has taught us, put our effective practices in place while students worked independently on meaningful tasks, including but not limited to time on Chromebooks. There's not enough time for me to list everything that did not fall into place after that workshop for my own class or for my colleagues. Unfortunately, I could no longer fly the plane and I can't rebuild it while I'm flying it either. It's crashed and there's no oxygen, oxygen mask that the district can provide that will suffice. I publicly must apologize to the many K2 teachers who joined my workshop in August, eager and willing to listen and how I explain step-by-step -step to introduce centers, train your students and give them your, give themselves a break when it was hard and they were overwhelmed and I encouraged them to keep at it. I followed my own expert advice and I am still struggling. I've cried more tears and started back with the basics more times than I can count. So it is time to ditch the oxygen mask as well as my pilot's license. I am jumping out of this crashing plane to save myself and my students. K2 teachers need a new metaphor and mode of transportation. How about a train? I like trains. They have different cars serving different needs and purposes. Teachers can be the engineers driving the train on the track to the next grade level. But now we're asking for support. We can't drive the train and serve the food in the dining car at the same time. We need help to punch the tickets and tend to the extra needs of our passengers.
This extra support needs to be consistent paraprofessionals in each K-2 classroom and to be a vital part of a team. Uh, 143 teachers have spoken and contributed to this ask. Please look at the results of our survey seriously. Do not try to put a Band-Aid on this situation. Our students need real solutions and commitments from you. Please ask questions you have, but don't fear the answers. And trust the experts, the teachers, who are in the classrooms wanting every child to succeed. Since you took away our ability to fly our planes, please let us continue our journey by train and support our new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have the Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. And their presentation was the student presentation tonight from Kinney. Okay. Uh, that finally takes us to the District English Learner Advisory Committee. There's no report this evening. Nope. All right. All right. So that uh, takes us to agenda item 10, agenda consent. Uh, is there a motion? Well, I should first ask, is there, does anybody want to pull anything off of the consent agenda? All right, uh, hearing none, uh, is there a motion? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Huey. I'll second. Second, second by uh, Ms. Sh uh, Shrivasto. Uh, Superintendent, uh, take the roll. Ms. Perez? Aye. Ms. Shrivasto? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Ms. Lorette? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Motion carries 5-0, thank you. And uh, Superintendent, are there any introductions? Yes, um, part of the consent agenda was approving the personnel action form and on that report tonight, uh, we have uh, an introduction we'd like to make for a new uh, head track coach at Cordova High School. And we're pleased to announce that um, the new head track coach is Anthony A.D. Davis, a Cordova High School graduate. A.D. grew up in Rancho Cordova and participated in football and track and field while in high school. He graduated from Fresno State and returned to Cordova High so he could give back to the community that helped him. Since 2015, AD has been an assistant football and track coach at Cordova High, where he's deepened his knowledge of both athletic programs and built strong connections with students. In addition to his service at the high school level, AD is part of the Junior Lancers coaching staff. We are excited and proud of our alumni who continue to support our students and community and AD is a true ambassador who rep represents Lancer pride. So we congratulate and welcome Anthony Davis. He isn't able to join us this evening, but hopefully he'll be able to join us at our next meeting. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, that moves us to agenda item 11, discussion slash action. The first one is approve revised governance handbook. Superintendent. Yes, what you have this evening is um, our revised governance handbook with a lot of uh, red line and, and additions to it after we had a really thorough discussion at our January 7th board study session. Um, again, our governance handbook defines our norms and expectations, roles and responsibilities of our governance team. And then we also have certain topics that address how um, we uh, conduct certain actions and uh, with that, we'd like to go through it. Um, some of these are just minor grammatical and um, c consistency in language, updating our board of trustees. Um, so we can move on to table of contents. We updated our vision mission statement. So we let's go over to page four. Oops, I think we, we skipped. Let's, let's go back, I'm sorry, to page three. So at the bottom of um, page three, we added a definition, which I think was really important. We had a lot of good discussion around what does consensus of the board mean? We had our legal counsel there and we all agreed that that's probably a definition we needed to add to this page. But our agreed upon definition of consensus is that my voice has been heard, I understand the topic or the proposal, and it is clear to me that the will of the group has emerged around the topic or proposal. So we added it there. Superintendent, did as you we go page by page, um, 
if board members have comments, should they make them while we're on that page? Yeah, or that, wait? that probably makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any uh, comments on this page? I'll, you know, I'll just say I, I learned maybe something. I wasn't hadn't really thought about it before legal counsel had mentioned. You know, I, I, I perhaps was using the word cons uh, consensus wrong. I always kind of was thinking major or everybody, uh, whereas legal counsel um, made it clear that that um, with those first two bullet points, it really is a majority, um, which I, I guess I never knew that before. So, all right, uh, let's move to the next. And the next page are the professional governance standards on, on gov, uh, standard number four. Um, we talked about treating the community, parents, students, staff, and the board with dignity and respect. So that was added. Okay. Any questions? Okay. That was just consistency and grammatics on that page with superintendent. Okay, moving on to the next page. So our vision statement now reflects our, our adopted vision statement that we adopted at the end of last school year, empowering all students to thrive through educational excellence, and then also our mission statement as um, stated there. So those are the revisions. We took out all the former language that was there with red lines. Then we moved on to adding our equity questions for decision making. And just a little background, these are questions that we've been using um, since we've been looking at our data very closely. They've come um, up at, through our data and what our data tells us when we look at our LCAP. But these are also questions that have um, been identified in our transformative SEL plan that we brought forward to the board. And our equity advisory committee has also um, define these questions. So we talked about them briefly at our study session, and I, I have given you a copy of these as well, that we consider these when we're making decisions. And we talked about possibly adding this to the page with the vision and the mission. And these questions um, are addressing what our data tells us. Who are the specific student groups impacted by the decision policy or practice? And how have we engaged diverse community voice in specifying the problem that needs to be solved, success criteria for the program, barriers that need to be removed in order to positively impact student outcomes? How will the action specifically address, accelerate, or improve outcomes for Black or African American, Hispanic, English learners, special education, foster and homeless, and or low-income students? And the reason those specific subgroups are called out is that when we look at our data and we're looking at our data right now through our LCAP data walks, are those the groups that are identified at the state when we're looking at disaggregating our data by subgroup? So as an overall district, we, we have one score, but then we break it down by these um, demographic groups that are identified by the state. And when we look at these groups, they are underperforming compared to um, the district as a whole. So we wanna make sure that uh, we consider these groups of students, but also all students. But sometimes this means that we have to double our effort or, or diversify our efforts to make sure that all students are um, moving forward, all students. And then the last question, what steps do we need to make sure that underserved students benefit from this academic enrichment and our wellness resource? So uh, I guess on this page, I, consensus, um, do, we, do we want to keep these questions here on this page? Um, we've also talked about our equity ad, uh, policy that we adopted uh, almost, well, almost two years ago. And we have that as well. Not sure what, um, because we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, if we wanted the equity questions here or just keep them in front of us as we're making decisions on behalf of all students. Um, I'm going to ask what the will of the board is and what the consensus is. I, I did have, uh, well, before I speak, um, um, besides, I do have some questions here, um, but as president, I should go last in speaking. Is there other folks that have any questions on this, this page? I don't think questions. I think um, given that this is something the entire district has a focus on and is guiding every to every meeting we have in our district, I think that having it front and foremost with our vision and mission, it will be what helps us get to our vision and mission. So I personally think it's a perfect placement because it is what gets us to that point, so. Any questions? 
Okay. Um, questions uh, that I have. Uh, I don't have a problem with this uh, uh, being prominently placed within uh, the governance handbook. My concern is that these uh, four questions don't align with board policy 0415, uh, which was uh, the policy that the board adopted. Some of the language that's in these four questions were actually in an original draft of board policy 0415, and the board had removed the language. Um, uh, we ended up with, uh, in board policy, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bullet points, um, which can also be turned into questions. Uh, in fact, I, if you, uh, I think each of the board members have a copy. I went through and, and copied the bullet points that the board had approved in, in board policy 0415. And what, um, at least I did my best, of what a hypothetical question would be for each of those bullet points. Um, uh, and these bullet points do not necessarily um, align uh, with our what we adopted so that that's my concern here not that you know we shouldn't have it we should have it and for that matter I, I don't mind it being on the the board uh, agenda uh, going forward as a reminder of what our uh, what we've committed to uh, in the area of equity but what I would like to see is consistency with board policy um, uh, yeah, so that's that's uh, my comments there. Would it be helpful to show the board policy, the sure. 0415? Yeah. And yeah, I was trying to remember when we adopted it. So it was sep September of 2021. So would you recommend that we have a, a, that board policy on the handbook or take the questions out altogether? Well, I, I, again, I don't know if I was the best person to, to craft questions for each of those bullet points, but um, you know, we could write, actually, these are the bullet points here, FCOSD shall, and there's the seven uh, bullet points. Um, you know, I was thinking that these, this, this would be a great uh, paragraph to put into our um, governance handbook. Um, it's uh, right out of our policy, um, and it's something that kind of reinforces what, um, what we have committed to. Can I ask really quickly how the four questions were created? I, I believe it was from the equity committee that pulled the equity policy to create those questions that drive decision making. I think it's two different things, personally. I think that this is what we shall do. This is sort of our norms in terms of how as a district are we going to be equitable? And these questions help us when we are asking ourselves questions in looking at these to say, is my decision going to follow what we've placed as a norm in our board policy? And so I think that it's two separate things. I think that I would find it appropriate to have both. This is a, as a norm of equity in our governance handbook, as well as the questions that bring us to fulfilling the vision and mission. Um, so, so I think that it's two sort of separate things as the equity team created this as a way to ensure that all of the questions were being asked and all of the decisions we're making fulfill our board policy. <coughs> well, the, well, again, I, parts of these questions, these four questions were um, in an earlier draft that we had as a board decided not to adopt. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm wondering why um, language or similar type of language that we as a board decided not to include in this policy is now in the, in the four questions. Um, I, I think the four questions are a subjective interpretation of board policy, that if you put a different uh, group of 10 people together to come up with questions, you would probably end up with different questions with each group of 10 people. Um, whereas this is clearly stated what the board has agreed to, um, uh, not the, the four questions that um, a non-board group has interpreted what, what the board was in, uh, intended. 
can I make a comment on that? Yeah. Sure. So I, I think getting back to Ms. Lofthouse's comment about the policy is the setting the norms. It sets the norms. It also is the why, the direction, which is the board's role to set direction. The questions, if we were to have an administrative regulation, would probably live in the AR, but we don't have an AR for this board policy at this time. However, when our equity team, um, equity advisory team, looked at our um, social emotional le um, learning transformative plan, we talked about you know those students that are not performing at the same level as what our data tells us. And our LCAP requires that we look at that data very deeply. And when you say, where did the questions come from? The questions came from Folsom Cordova Unified data and from our, from our students. Um, what, we're, what we're not saying is we're not, we're not going to ignore the students that are not listed here. We're, we're gonna double our efforts to make sure that those students that aren't performing at the levels that we want them to, to meet our vision statement are given those supports to do so. That's why we did a redistribution of the supplemental dollars of the LCFF. That's why we have differentiated funding and resources for our students that bring in those resources. So it reminds us of our vision statement, you know, to make sure that we're helping all students achieve, you know, through that educational excellence. And think about your own children. You know, I have four children that are grown now, but they all are successful, but not with the same types of supports growing up. As parents, we make those decisions. As a school district, as leaders, as a board, we're making those decisions to make sure that we're empowering all students to get there, um, but not lose sight of those that might be under the radar because our, our data at a district level is showing a, a much higher you know, proficiency. I mean, I, I guess I, I would point out um, and it's just one example of, of how this w has been subjectively interpreted. Uh, in the third bullet point, um, we don't see boys listed, even though statistically boys are struggling not only in our district, but nationwide. Um, again, it's, it, when we start to pick uh, and identify, you know, where do you start drawing the line of, well, we're not gonna worry about boys. Um, uh, that's, well, that's, that's a concern that's that concern. you've brought forward and we are taking seriously. Matter of fact, when we looked at our data and you know the upcoming 10 data walks that we're doing, it's all broken down by gender because there is a discrepancy. And we thank you for bringing that forward. Yeah. Um, it's not one of those data points that the state points out, but it's one Folsom Cordova is gonna pay attention to as we do these data walks and look at the gender differentials you know, in, in the different areas that the state tells us that we need to be looking at. Um, and we think that's very important too. That hasn't been addressed yet here because these questions, you know, um, came about from the state's data um, and the subgroups that they identified. But we're not ignoring that. We're going to add it. Uh, Board President. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and I think if we can have these four questions in the governance handbook, that doesn't negate the board policy that we already have in place. So because they don't mention boys in the governance handbook doesn't mean that we wouldn't want to disaggregate that data and look at that. Um, I don't think we have to have an all-inclusive list in the governance handbook. This is, you know, these are questions that the district's asking and then questions that, that will help us guide in our decision-making. This is not an, um, it's, not a, it's not the board policy. That's in a separate location. So, I mean, I would, I would recommend we leave it in here. It doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to look at this other document as well. Any other thoughts? I probably vote to have both both items included. To be honest with you, I think that having both in there just kind of gives direction for what our commitment is, and then having the questions, I think, is you know going to drive us as we move forward with the decisions. So, my only question with that is that we don't include all the other board policies. So, why would the one individual board policy be pulled and put into our governance handbook in a separate location when when we have the board policy? This is just kind of our guiding handbook of how do we, how do, we do our job. And so um, we have the board policy that tells us what we need to do, and then we have our handbook which tells us how to do it. So. So, well, uh, consensus. <laughs> um, it sounds like, well, I think we have a consensus, uh, meaning uh, well, with the definition that we had before. Uh, it, it, does anybody else want to speak on this? 
sounds like the consensus is uh, to leave these uh, four questions in. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. We will move to the next page. Then. So we'll, we'll, shall we continue going on and then ask for a comment from the public at the end? Since this is yeah, discussion let's, let's, active. let's just do the, the public at the end. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next page then, governance roles and responsibilities. This was uh, something that um, one of our board members had heard at CSBA and thought it would be really important to um, start this section with this paragraph, demonstrating community leadership is the only Locally affected official, elected officials chosen solely to represent the interests of students. Board members have a responsibility to speak out on behalf of children. Board members are advocates for students, the districts, or County Office of Education's educational programs and public education. They build support within their communities and at the state and national levels. All good? Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Moving Next on. Page. Next page was just um, changing the order of the words, basically says the same thing, that we're working together as a governance team. Next page, I think, is just um, capital typos. Um, on to the next page. Uh, 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 yes. Yeah. Chris. Are we, we're on the performing governance responsibilities, right? Yes. Page, um, page seven. Is it page seven? Yeah. Um, I know we're probably going to, go down to page nine because it looks like there's really nothing else that needs to be corrected except a grammatical thing. Uh, can we go to page nine? Sure. I think, yeah, I think you're right. No. It's, it's all technical. Okay. So maybe I'm looking at something totally different. The Board of Education protocols, governance norms. That's uh, page eight still. So, yeah, uh, there we are. Yeah, I've got something totally different. Um, well, anyway, it's uh, not board meeting prep preparation. Uh, board meeting management. Which number is that? Um, well, it's actually on page, looks like page 11. Why don't we first, uh, we'll get to page 11. Why okay. Just first confirm whether um, the current page is, anybody have any questions on that? All right. Uh, next page, page 10. Up. It's actually page 9. Go back to page 9. Okay. Oh, this is like totally, I'm looking at something totally different. Okay. Well, anyway, um, it would actually be under. Uh, protocols board meeting management and I touched on it earlier um, regarding the time um, and this is actually a CSBA recommendation along with the uh, uh, government code section 54954.3 that authorizes boards to set reasonable time limits on the total amount of time allowed allotted for public comment on a particular issue and for each individual speaker Many boards have set specific time allowances in their policies. Often individual speakers will be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item, and the board will limit the time, total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. However, in exceptional circumstances, when necessary, to, f to full opportunity for public input, the board president may, with board consent, adjust the amount of time allowed for public input and or time allotted for each speaker. And then it goes on to say board members should be clear in that this ability to limit the time for individual speakers and for public testimony on a particular topic is meant to further the law's goal allowing the public an adequate opportunity to speak to the board. One of my concerns is, and so what if, um, now you have it at two minutes, but, and here's my what if, what if we have somebody that needs a translator? Are we going to change that time to give them enough time to speak, uh, knowing that 
they're going to need help with the translator. I think that would be reasonable. Yeah. So it goes back to um, maybe we do need to have the three minutes. Uh, if it's something con contentious, and I, we trust me, in 2020 we had that, um, you know, maybe with consensus of the board we can make that change. Um, but I'm I'm totally pushing for the three minutes as allowed by uh, government code and uh, CSBA. Now, we, we can certainly, uh, as a consensus of the board, return to three minutes. Uh, part of the reason why we went to two minutes is because we wanted, uh, our meetings were running very long, uh, as I think everybody is, is aware, um, and we wanted uh, everybody who uh, had a voice to be able to share their voice. If uh, we did three minutes and then four minutes for students, um, we would then have to start probably imposing time caps on uh, subject ma on, on agenda items just so that we uh, don't go into the wee hours of the morning. Um, and, uh, and by doing that, we're depriving some speakers altogether of speaking. So the, the reason why we took it, to, like even tonight, um, uh, if you, uh, the number of speakers who spoke during uh, public comment, um, would, we would have ended up capping them uh, at 20 minutes sure. and not all of the, uh, the speakers would have had an opportunity to speak. So it, it's a balancing effort, right? It's, um, do you, uh, you know, shorten the time to allow more speakers, you lengthen the time and then having to tell some speakers you need to find someone who's, you know, if you're just simply saying me too to someone else, you know, you can, that's all you need, that's all you have to have time to say. Um, but I, I'm completely open to the consensus of the board. I don't think we need to amend our governance document. We already have that authority. It's uh, the board just needs to make the decision whether they want to allow three minutes going forward or two minutes going forward. That's all. Okay, and and if I may, um, I know that sometimes folks will come in and they'll have the same viewpoint. And I know we've we've discussed this before that if they're talking about the same subject, that they allow uh, a representative to speak on their behalf. Um, so, you know, maybe we ought to take that in consideration as well. I mean, I'm all for the three minutes. I think. As long as we don't have a room full of people and you know, it's uh, not something major, uh, three minutes should be sufficient enough and four minutes for our students. Mr. President, yes. I, I would agree with Mr. Clark. I think we need three minutes. Um, you know, having been up at the podium, trying to talk and jam everything you need to say in two minutes is actually very taxing and very stressful. Um, so I think giving the three minutes, you know, and then if we can kind of maybe adjust if we need to, if we have a packed room that we adjust at that point. But, you know, I mean, comparative to most of our last meetings, having three minutes, I don't think would have been, you know, running a super, super long on a meeting. Um, I would note that if you start a meeting, you can't switch halfway through. Um, so if you start a meeting at three minutes, it's three minutes for the whole. But one way, one way we might be able to consider it uh, uh, hypothetically just the amount of speaker is, cards, is the, depending on the number of speaker cards. If we, you could say, if you have less than fill in the blank, twenty speaker cards, or, or if you, or maybe that's too high, but if you have below you know a certain number of speaker cards, uh, then at the start of the meeting, then we will go with three minutes. If we have over whatever that threshold is, then we'll go to two minutes. That way, we'll, at least we'll be consistent. And um, I mean, I, I think that might potentially work. If I think the board did a lot of that pivoting when we, you know, we had unknown numbers of the public that wanted to address the board, and the board at that time was committed to hearing our public. So, you know, you you make um, exceptions uh, for those extreme examples, but I think. You know, on the norm, the three minutes is is good, um, unless you know we see that we're going to have to manage time differently. And if we have anyone with exceptional needs that needs more time or needs a translator, I think this board has always been gracious in that and and understanding and giving that ample time as well. Sure. All right. Well, it sounds like we have a consensus, even though this actually technically isn't uh, this item, but um, I think that's okay. Um, sounds like we have a consensus moving forward that we will have three minutes and uh, uh, and then on an as needed basis, depending on the size of the audience, we as a board may decide to take it down to two minutes. Sound right? 
Okay. But we don't really, we don't need to memorialize it in yeah. the protocol, but yeah. it, it lives in our board policy right now or it board is. bylaw. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Shall we move on? Uh, I'm not sure what page we're on. Uh, I think, well, I think we asked if there was any uh, questions or comments on nine. I don't think there wasn't. So let's go to 10 then. Oh, which is the next page. Oh, well, then I'll have to bring that forward. Yeah, topic three. Okay. Any questions, comments on this one? Okay. Page uh, 11. Um, any questions, comments on this one? I do have one, uh, I think it's uh, grammatical, I would say. On topic seven, um, I think we need to take the first new bullet point and change it to reflect, or uh, wait a second, board business allows board members an opportunity to, and then it says reflections. I think, it, uh, don't we mean have an opportunity to reflect on the board meeting, not reflections on the board meeting? Okay. Yeah. So if we could uh, <coughs> change, could change that. that change. Uh, page 12. Any questions on that one? All right. Page 13. I think these are all just uh, changing the case of the letter. So, page 14. I would want to point out um, the infographic that we put together that goes along with um, what's highlighted there is the complaint procedure guidelines to be followed. And we spent some time talking about that at our study session as well. And I asked Rochelle if she could take us to that attachment. And I want to thank Angela and her team for helping put the graphics together. And hopefully it reflects, you know, the steps that we talked about when we were looking at the example from Carmel Unified, but we put it in uh, to make sense for Folsom Cordova. Bless you. I do think this is a wonderful flyer, um, and I love the color on it as well. It, it really pops, and it really is clear. Um, <coughs> I, I, uh, well, let me, before I make my comment, uh, because I do have an edit, is there any other comments or edits on it? I would just say, as a parent, I think this would be very helpful <laughs> to know what steps A, a through Z would be, um, because sometimes... We don't know as parents um, sometimes what protocols are. So, um, you know, I think this is going to be very helpful for the, for the public to be able to kind of understand um, how things flow. And um, I think it'll actually probably get them faster results um, in the long run. I just had a question. Um, is this translated in other languages? It will be. Right now it's still in the draft format, but that's a good point. We will make sure it is as the other documents on our website are great thank you mm -hmm. um, my uh, two observations one is on step four I'm wondering to be consistent with how we worded steps two and three whether step four shouldn't read something along the lines of lastly uh, contact the board and this is adding if you feel your concern is unresolved after talking with the superintendent's office or, and then pick up where regarding issues that relate to policy and community concerns. Uh, because in step three, we did indicate if you feel your concern is unresolved after talking with your school. In step two, we did say if you believe your concern is unresolved after step one, we didn't say that on step four. I think the reason for that and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the board has certain things that we actually have control over. And limiting the communication, if it's just strictly a concern that we, we truly can't make any impact on where the superintendent or appropriate offices of special ed, curriculum and instruction, finance, human, human resources, whatnot, and this specifically says if it relates to board policy, because that's really what we can actually even respond to. Because if it's not something that relates to what we do as a board, our response will be, 
please reach out to the superintendent or please reach out to the superintendent of special education. And we would be redirecting to that as well. So I think this kind of is very specific and this is what we really are here to hear about. Otherwise we will have to redirect to somebody who can actually make an impact or change for you. Um, so. Well, the, the one, you're correct, but the one employee that we do have is the superintendent. And if we don't have a way to have, if anybody, not saying we have any complaints, but <laughs> to say, you know, if, if someone for some reason feels that there's a justification for having to have that conversation, we, we're not telling them that there's that opportunity. That, that's the, I mean, yes, we are the policy. That Which is, would probably yeah. violate a board policy, right? So if, if the superintendent's not doing her job, there's board policy that is written that. So yeah, you can make that, yeah, make that argument. Anyway, it's just an observation, um, whatever it's worth. Uh, I could go either way on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's fine the way it is. It, I would imagine in reality if somebody's been willing to go through steps one through three and they haven't got what they wanted, we're probably going to hear about it. I, I suspect we might even hear it before they get through steps one through three, but yes, uh, I, I, would, I would agree. And then there are also other complaint processes um, that some of those concerns might have to travel down, like if it's a uniform complaint or a Title IX. So, you know, sometimes we have to redirect and we've... Um, we have more information on that down at the bottom about specific topics, but sometimes they do get redirected into those lanes as well. Yeah. Uh, the other uh, question that I had is, would it, and it may not make any sense, but would it make any sense to have a QR code uh, like uh, somewhere, I would assume on, well, on, on any, any one of these, I guess I would ask, you know, that if someone's like, well, how do I contact the school? What's the telephone number? You know, is there a, a QR code that could take you to the list of all the, the schools and their their contact numbers or something like that? I don't want to clutter this up because, it, Angela, it is a beautiful document. So if, if you know, if, you know I, I suspect if, if their child goes to the school, they could probably figure out a way to get in touch with the school. So maybe it's not necessary. So anyway. So uh, back to uh, page 14. Was there any other items on there? Okay. And that takes us to page 15. Any uh, questions, comments there? We did add the comment there about um, doing our um, formal self-evaluation with CSBA every other year. So we've actually reached out to them and we're gonna do, uh, and two board members will be joining me for a call with CSBA to just talk about the process and see if this is something we wanna do this spring in preparation for our June study session. And then we could do the every other year, you know, internally and then with CSBA externally. But um, does this capture what we, our intention was? Uh, page 16, questions, uh, this one is uh, the roles and responsibilities <coughs> of the student board rep members. Uh, question, comments on this one. My only uh, question is on the first bullet point, um, uh, just for clarity. Since we are transitioning to, uh, I guess, direct election of our two student board members, um, and I guess this is maybe a question for the student board members, how, how logistically, how is this going to work? If, uh, is it, is the candidates that, who identified that they want to run for this position going to be told if you are elected, you are going to serve as co-chair of the SAB or co-president of the SAB? Is that how that's going to work? Yeah. Do you mean, um, the, the student board member is SAB's co-president? Yes. Um, so we're still working on the details, but I think right now the way we're looking at it is, uh, the student board member will have to have at least a year of SAB experience, um, and that will make them, you know, eligible to be a student board member and SAB co-president. How is that going to work with direct, direct election from the student body? So the way that we're thinking about it right now, which I'm a little bit unsure about it, is that we'll have 
um, an SAB representative, those are the only candidates allowed, but the whole student body will be voting for them. Um, and the way that we're hoping to get the message out about each candidate is through um, a video process and an, a, a short bio about them. Um, in addition to, um, we have an SAB video about what SAB is, um, and also just plenty of information about the role of student board member, um, some input from our CO and I about what the student board member does, things like that. Um, all right. I guess I, I did not realize uh, that we were, uh, that's the way it was going to be interpreted regarding the election of student board members. I thought any student that was, um, any student that attended uh, a high school in Rancho Cordova could put their name forward to run. Uh, and any student that attended a, a, a high school in Folsom would be able to put their name forward to run. I didn't r realize we were going to impose a requirement that they s have served on the student advisory board. Yeah, and I think that's still a conversation that's being had. Um, we haven't decided one way or the other. I think, right, right Dr. Kalian? Yeah, uh, last year in the handbook, because it came together pretty late in the process, we, we did put allow more flexibility, but we did say that with... Um, the following year, we would say student board members would have had to have been a student advisory board member prior and an 11th or 12th grader. So that was actually in the handbook last year. We weren't able to implement it last year because there wasn't enough time to do so. But when Ria and Rosio asked SAB yesterday about, um, the, you know, the, the wording about a student board member having the experience on SAB and being an 11th or 12th grader, I think it was pretty clear that they thought that was very important. Right. Yeah, I definitely think um, just understanding the structure of student advisory board and also having interacted with the board before, um, obviously both Rocio and I were student advisory board members for multiple years before being appointed as student board member. So um, I think there's definitely a benefit to having past prior experience um, and being able to understand kind of the, di the dynamics. Um, but it's definitely a conversation we'll bring back to SAB. We had a packed agenda um, yesterday, but um, if we're able to have a further conversation, that's definitely something we'll consider. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would encourage, uh, I guess, SAB to keep uh, the opportunity to run broad um, I, I mean, at least for me, that was my understanding of the board policy that we just amended that would allow the entire student body to participate. Um, and I could be wrong, but if, if, I, if I was a student at any of the high schools and I wanted to run for student body president, am I being, would I be limited uh, to only run if I belong to a, cl to a, to a club? You, to be um, ASB president, you have to have past ASB experience. You have to have been an ASB for at least a year before becoming president. So, so at the high school level, they do limit uh, yes. those individuals who can run for student body president to just um, with some preconditions. Correct. All right. All right. So I, well, I guess that would be somewhat consistent. Then. Yeah, and um, I was also wondering um, if it might make sense in the first bullet, because it says representatives sh shall serve concurrently representing two different high schools. Um, might we update that to reflect that it will be a student uh, from Rancho Cordova and one from Folsom? That would be consistent with our r recent board bylaw right. okay. change that we just approved. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we can make that revision that they're reflective of Rancho Cordova and Folsom. I guess one final question uh, or maybe suggestion uh, to SAB, you know, would it be possible to at least consider um, anybody who's a member of SAB or who has served um, on the, the uh, I'm sorry, what, what did you describe it? The ASB. A ASB. ASB, yes. So would that be something that you might be able to have a conversation about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can, we'll take it back to SAB and see what the input is of the group. Um, another thing we might consider is, you know, having prior experience in leadership or, you know, whether that be leading an affinity group or something of the sort. So um, it's definitely a conversation we'll have and we'll bring it back at the next meeting. Yeah, I, I just think, um, you know, like there could be hypothetical some some folks who for whatever reason can't don't have the time to serve on SAB but they're right. in the leadership mm -hmm. at their schools so yeah okay 
All right. Uh, page 16. Actually, this was an edit that I had. Uh, the, we have two page 16s. This uh, second page 16 should be 17. Yeah. Any other edits on this page? I think just um, clarification, we talk about reviewing these norms prior to the annual organizational meeting um, yes. at every election year. I guess the question is, do we want that to happen every year to go over the governance handbook at a, you do the Saturday study session maybe in December before we do the organizational meeting? So if organizational meeting next year, I think would be December 14th or 15th, it would maybe be the Saturday before and then we wouldn't do that first Saturday in January. Yeah, and I think I think that was the consensus of the, the board at our study session that we move our study session from January to the week and before our December board meeting to um, even on non-election years. I think that's healthy okay. uh, to have that. I think you have to review it every year because things yeah. change, and it's yeah. a it's a living document almost. So yeah, we do. It's just the timing of doing it before the organizational meeting, which is that December fourteenth or fifteenth meeting. So we'll we'll amend the calendar to reflect that. Thank you. All right. Um, I think uh, public comment. Uh, is there any public comment on this agenda item? You have, I think you have a card oh, there. One card, but one card. Oh, did I? I? Here you go. You, yep, just got flipped upside down. Oh, all right. Uh, Christina Cook, welcome. Hey, can we just go back to the equity questions? I don't remember what page. Yeah, right there. Was, yeah. I just wanted to echo what Ms. Lofthouse said regarding the board policy and it being different than the equity questions that we should be asking. I think it's really important that in every single thing that we do, no matter what we do, that we look at things through a lens of equity and also that we have to always be consciously aware that every single decision that we make, no matter how small, no matter how, no matter how big, affects our students, our teachers, everyone in this district, and that other districts look at us to be leaders in this area. And I'm really proud that we do have the equity questions that are being used um, so that we can advocate for our marginalized groups. So if we could post those up there one more time, can we do that? Yeah, I think, I think it's, on, okay. I think it's on page you. four. No, page, yeah, page four. There we go. Awesome, so I, I think it's really important that every single person that does decision making in this district really thinks about every single one of those, even if it's frustrating to you, even if it makes you uncomfortable to talk about these issues, it's imperative that we have these conversations, even if they're difficult conversations. So thank you. Thank you. Any comments on, oh, we got one more. Yes. Welcome. Could you go to the flyer? The flyer, sure. Go all the way up to number one. All right, so it says um, contact teachers and or staff allow staff 24 hours, 48 hours to respond. So there's, n um, so just twofold. Um, I answer my emails and my phone messages, weekends, evenings, whatever. I, that's not communication, it's not my issue. But there are some teachers who, they work contract hours, which is perfectly fine as well. This doesn't go, it doesn't correspond with and our contract and or because it says school business hours, our contract hours are not school business hours because that's 7.30 to four or eight to four that's not our things. And then what if a teacher is sick? Because I'm assuming the 24 to 48 hours is not literally 24 or 48 hour business hours. It's one to two days. Would it make more sense to say during business days rather than school business days, rather than hours? Well, actually it would make sense if you went ahead and you, if you're dealing with teachers, it would be business slash teacher hours. Oh, by the way, I have to chastise myself. I'm not supposed to interact with the... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying this just, it, it, it doesn't parallel a lot of the current practices that, with, that are contract and or possible... Superintendent. That so, um, yeah. That's all I have to say. Um, perhaps uh, stat, you and staff can... Um, that's a beautiful document. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can work with... Uh, um, the communications department to make sure that the appropriate language goes there. 
All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you. The one online with Jarita. Okay. Caroline? Caroline, welcome. Are you there, Caroline? Oh, Caroline. Is she muted by chance? Can you tell? Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll move forward then. All right, uh, let's see. So uh, back to the board, uh, any final, uh, this, is, uh, this is an item for uh, action tonight. Any final comments, questions? No? Um, I uh, will be explaining my vote. Uh, I'll do that right now. Um, I will be voting against the governance handbook uh, due to the subjective interpretation of the equity questions uh, for decision making. Uh, I am very supportive of equity. I voted for the adoption of the, the board's equity policy, uh, policy and uh, I support that. Uh, but um, I am not in, su in support of the subjective interpretation of that policy. All right, uh, is there a motion to approve? Motion that we approve with the uh, uh, edits that we discussed tonight. No okay. second. A motion by uh, Mr. Huey and a second by Mr. Clark. Superintendent, take the roll. Yes, Ms. Perez. Aye. Mr. Srivastav. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Lorette. Aye. Ms. Lofthouse. Aye. Mr. Reed. No. Okay, motion carries 4 1. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us, uh, let's see, to approve job descriptions and salary schedule. Superintendent. This item tonight allows um, us to make some minor revisions in the um, two job descriptions for certificated management. The positions are Assistant Superintendent Educational Services and Associate Superintendent Human Resources, both updated to reflect the very descriptive role of a Title IX coordinator, the duties and responsibilities. And we've been working with legal counsel to make sure that the job description is in alignment with everything Title IX coordinators do. So these two job descriptions reflect that now because they are both Title IX coordinators. Um, there's no change in the salary schedule, so that would be the only change the board would be approving for certificated management. And on the certificated side, a speech and language pathologist job description has also been updated. Um, there's additional responsibilities that include supervising the speech and language pathologist assistants and their salaries um, are amended to reflect that responsibility. So those are um, the two major changes on this agenda item. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Or uh, questions, comments, excuse me. Any comments online? All right, back to the board. Any final questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion? I motion. A motion by Ms. Lofthouse. Oh, second. Um, uh, second by Ms. Lorette. Superintendent, uh, take the roll. Ms. Perez. Aye. Ms. Trivasov. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Mr. Huey. Aye. Ms. Lorette. Aye. Ms. Lofthouse. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us to agenda item 12, discussion. Uh, the first one is a budget update, the governor's proposed budget for 2023-2024. Yeah, so the governor released his proposed state budget for 23-24 on Wednesday, January 10th. And um, several of us attended the school services workshop um, and Mr. Martin has taken that information and has put together a summary of what some of the proposals are. We also shared this with our budget advisory committee meeting last week, but um, since then information has been updated and will continue to be revised at the state level um, until such time that the board, I mean the state adopts their budget. But right now we'll take a first blush at next year's budget, Mr. Martin. All right. Yeah, a lot of good information in here, positive for schools and education. Um, so we'll just come do some highlights, quick overview. I'll answer any questions you have. Um, this is a summary information from several different uh, organizations that uh, we use, so I have those there. Um, I really want to make people understand that this is not the actual state budget for 23-24. This is just the governor's first proposal. 
Um, timeline process wise, the governor will actually have a revised proposal in May. It's called the May revise. And then at that point, there will actually be the negotiations that will happen between the legislature and the governor to come together for a final actual state budget. And that will happen in June. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll know that. But the truth is, is we, we will use probably the May revise for the majority of what we do for developing our adopted budget because we have to bring to the board uh, the first draft in early Jan uh, June and then approval probably before we will have all the details on the state budget. And that is just the normal process. So just want to make sure everybody understands this is the governor's first proposal with the current economic information that he has available because we know the economy is definitely changing weekly, daily, monthly. And so a lot of these figures and numbers potentially will have a, a different number when we get to, to the actual adoption in June. Okay. Uh, the governor's proposal for the Prop 98 uh, is about $108 billion. It's actually a little less than last year's Prop 98 allocation. So Prop 98 is the specific proposition that requires a certain portion of the state uh, revenues to go to education. And so um, not getting into all the particulars of that, there's three different methods to do that calculation. And so um, this is where we're at at this time. Uh, really, the, there isn't a lot of new programs associated with the state budget, even though there is quite a bit of revenues. It's really focusing on uh, funding the COLA that is being proposed along with uh, continuing the transitional kindergarten um, age increase. So now uh, the TK for 23-24 will actually go all the way up until April, uh, through April 1st. So if a student turns five between September and April, they will be able to be available in the transitional kindergarten. So that, that's expanding. The number of students that potentially would qualify will continue to grow. Um, and then the governor is also proposing um, a COLA increase to categorical programs and a new program uh, that he's calling the LCFF equity multiplier. So we'll talk about all of those things as well. Um, and so one of the big things that we are really questioning between now and May is the realities of how he's funding some of these items um, in the budget and what the uh, economic outlook uh, will be more like in May. So, uh, so highlights, the big one is the COLA, 8.13%. That is the largest COLA, I, I believe, uh, that has been added to, so, well, at least for sure, since LCFF has been uh, created. And, going back even to the revenue limit days. Um, at first interim, we were projecting the COLA for 23-24 to be about 5.38%. That was the proposed rate that we were using at the time. So obviously this would be a, a significant increase in the COLA and revenues to the school district uh, for 23-24. Uh, that would be about almost $6 million in additional revenue. Um, if, if you'll remember the multi-year projection for 23-24 actually had us with about a $9 million deficit. So obviously this would go a long way towards filling that gap of that deficit. Um, it should be recognized that the Legislative Analyst Office, uh, their, their projected COLA is actually 8.73. So, um, uh, but also the Consumer Price Index uh, uh, for December was 6.5%. So we're actually seeing inflation starting to drop off. And so um, depending on when these assumptions are made and the factors they're using at those times, um, it's very volatile. And so I'm hearing that the COLA could potentially even go down. Originally, I thought it would definitely go up, but I'm hearing because of some of the cooling factors and on inflation and some other areas. So it will be interesting to see the, the remaining uh, economic factors that go into play for the last couple of months here. Um, one of the big pieces that we have a lot of questions about is the governor is wanting to fund the COLA, which is an ongoing revenue increase with one-time funds which is something that, you know, obviously we come to the board all the time and say you never want to do that, right? Unless you have a very specific plan or a reason, you don't want to use one-time money for ongoing costs because the very next year, you don't have that one-time money, but you got to still pay the cost. And so then, then that can very quickly, especially if there's an additional COLA increase or anything else, you can very quickly get upside down because you don't have the funds to cover all of that. So we do have a lot of questions in the education finance community right now about how is the governor planning to do this and, and why in this way, especially when he's wanting to uh, use some of the ongoing money for new program versus trying to fully fund COLA. So there are some questions about that for sure. Um, COLA is also applied to all of the, uh, some of the big categorical funds, including special education, food services. You can see the list there. The big one for us is special education. Um, that that uh, COLA increase would get us approximately additional about a little over a million, $1.2 million in additional revenues. 
Um, but I, I, you know, we, we need to be really realistic with our special education. Um, we are seeing a significant increase in services and costs associated with special education. Um, and that's before any kind of step and column or any other staffing adjustments, just, just new program and needs of the students that are coming in and then the identified IEP services, um, non, non public school placements, residential placements, all of those activities. And, and we'll spend more time talking about that um, at second interim as well when we look at what kind of cost increases we're looking at for those things. So. Uh, the new program that the governor is proposing is this LCFF equity multiplier. Um, it's $300 million. It would be an ongoing cost, and the governor is using ongoing money to, to fund this program. And this is why one of the questions we're having is, is why, why would we create a new program right now when we know all the different economic uh, um, stressors that we have going on in the budget process? Uh, the program is supposed to be targeting individual sites. So unlike the LCFF model, which it looks at unduplicated percentage by the district, this, this pot would actually be looking at the specific school site, which love that idea. We, we've talked about the fact that we, we miss out on some of the revenues and, and opportunities because of the fact that we have a blended UPP percentage. The governor's proposal here is uh, looking at it by site, but the threshold is very, very high. It's looking at your, the student population of that school has to be 90% and qualify not as an unduplicated pupil, which is multiple categories, but only looking at if they qualify for free uh, meals under the federal uh, meal program, which that kind of put, throws you for a loop because we don't really have a way to disaggregate that information for us. We do have two school sites that free and reduced wise, they're up over the 90%, Cordova Gardens and White Rock. So there is a potential that they may qualify, but we, we don't actually do free and reduced normal applications for those sites because they're CEP sites. We just do income verification. And so we don't delineate between reduced and free for that application process. And so there's a lot of questions about how this would potentially be implemented. Um, but um, there is a potential that those two sites could see revenues or, or see dollars from this program. Uh, we have other sites that are just uh, underneath that threshold. You can see there at Cordova Villa, uh, Cordova Meadows, Williamson, they're all underneath the 90% threshold. And, and remember, this is not UPP. This is just looking at free and reduced meal percentage, which is, a, is one subset of the UPP calculation. So in, more or less, English language learners and foster youth aren't considered in this calculation. So you know, we have a lot of different questions with it. There, there has been a, a immediate kind of pushback, I would say, from some in the legislature uh, there, that had uh, created some, some assembly uh, bills that they had proposed last year that were trying to target certain um, populations that uh, the governor was trying to use this funding as, as kind of a, an a optional replacement for those um, requests. And so um, I think there's going to be a lot of questions and discussion in the legislature and the governor on this particular activity. So, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my uh, head up high to say that this is definitely going to happen in this structure or this dollar amount or any of the pieces. I, I think we'll know a lot more at the May revise. Uh, next one is Prop 98. This is actually not in the budget, but this was recently, this was the proposition that was passed in November that funds uh, uh, art and music or uh, the arts um, uh, as part of the requirement of the state budget. So this passed uh, in the state of California and more or less there is a requirement that is equal to 1% of the K-12 share of the state budget. It's an additional 1%. They're not taking the dollars away from the K-12 Prop 98. They're doing an additional amount and it's, it's going to be funding at site level um, additional um, art and music activities at those school sites. Um, we have some very preliminary allocations. Um, at some sites, it could be sufficient enough to, to purchase a full-time position. At other sites, it, it could be uh, significantly less than that. It's a, the formula is actually based off of student population and then also unduplicated population. So there's two, two factors that they use in the calculation of that. Uh, but just like a lot of activities, we're still waiting for clear language from CDE on the application, the timeline for the dollars. We don't anticipate for the first year in 23-24 that the dollars and the information will be received in time that we would be able to fully implement this program in the first year. Um, just like any new program, it'll probably take a year before the state gets everything lined up that we will be able to then hire or do all the pieces that are necessary to implement these programs. But one big requirement is 80% of the expenditures do need to go to personnel at the site. Um, and none of the funds can be other than 1% can be allocated out at the district level. So it's site, very site-driven um, funding. Uh, 
So, and then, you know, it will be part of the SIPSA plan, school plans, all that kind of type of thing once we have all those details. Um, separate from that, um, the governor is doing something we haven't also seen before, which is a, a funding source or allocation of funding that was approved in this year's budget in 22-23. He's uh, making a recommendation to decrease that funding amount in 23-24, which we actually haven't seen something like this before. Um, so we had a, a one-time discretionary pot called Art, Music, Instructional Materials. Um, and we've talked about this one before. This one could cover operational costs, COVID. There was, it was pretty open-ended. Uh, we do have to bring a plan to the board before spending any of these funds on what we would spend these dollars on. Um, but the governor is actually looking at reducing that amount uh, by about 35%. Uh, which fortunately for us, we didn't, we didn't specifically target these dollars and, and already allocate them and spend them. Because if we had, and this governor was proposing this, we would obviously have some serious concerns because um, it is a significant difference for us. So instead of about $12.5 million, we would only receive about $8 million. Now, this is only one-time money, so it would be only a one-time loss of the $4.5 million, but it's still significant dollars. What the governor is saying is because of Proposition 28, um, he is wanting to pull back some of those dollars, those one-time dollars, and then use those to backfill other parts. In fact, he's using that to fully fund the COLA. That, that's that one-time money with the COLA. So more or less he's using the money here to pay for the, the COLA um, with one-time dollars. And that's where we have concerns. So this feels a little bit um, like wonky accounting, right? And um, so we're concerned about the house of cards when it comes to that, that model. So. Um, some other factors for us to be considering, um, I, I'm going to be providing more information that this is second interim when we bring a multi-year projection. Um, that will include new numbers for 23, 24. But one of the big ones that we want to uh, identify right now is, is our attendance rate and the fact that our ADA is um, continuing to drop from each reporting period. So at first interim, um, I projected our, our ADA or average daily attendance to be uh, 19,185 is what I have there. Um, however, when we did our first reporting, our first actual official reporting to the state, um, we were at uh, about 100 ADA less. Um, and so that is something that we're going to need to monitor because that actually puts us closer to about 93% attendance to enrollment. And when I do that percentage, it's different than what you may hear if uh, when we do some of the other reports that maybe we get from Scott or other departments because I'm looking at the traditionally the way we analyze attendance to enrollment is we use seabeds as our enrollment. So that's a snapshot as of October. And then we look at uh, the ADA based off of normally when we at P2, which is our reporting period. So that that percentage, when I say 93% or 95 or whatever the numbers I use, it's based off of that standardized formula. Whereas a lot of times when um, Scott or some of the other departments are talking about attendance, they're looking at actual attendance for the whole year to actual enrollment for the whole year. Meaning they look at every day and the adjustments to attendance and enrollment and the changes uh, corresponding to that. So that's why their numbers are often a little different than mine. So mine's for a very specific purpose because that's what we use to standardize our projections for the out years. We use a, a, a historical um, percentage and then we multiply it by what we think the enrollment's gonna be and that's how we calculate attendance for the out years. What we have traditionally been is around 95.5%. And so um, at first interim, I actually lowered it to 95% um, for the projection for attendance for the out years. And our concern now is, you know, when we're talking as a team about this is if we're averaging 93% right now, um, what should we project for next year, the next couple of years, right, when we're building the budget? Do we, do we use 93%? Do we go back to 95.5%, right? Uh, I think what we are seeing is, is this lower attendance rate, it may be the new normal, especially with... Um, all of the pieces that came with COVID and if you have the sniffles or you have a cough, you, you know, it used to be you would go to school and, you know, we're not, we don't have that same level of expectation now. Um, and, you know, I, I think anecdotally we're hearing a lot of conversations from uh, out at the site level that, you know, there are families that are taking vacations and doing other things that maybe they're not prioritizing, um, you know, attendance as much as in the past, you know. Um, and so we need to look at that. And so that is something that Scott's team and the, I think Scott and Kate are working on an attendance task force, and so we're looking at some of those things because what we need to know is is if we're going to lose 2%, um, you're, you're looking you know, at a, a, a lot of money. You're looking at $4 million plus in revenue that just disappears, right? And we have all the same costs, um, but because of that, that attendance rate not being 95%, being 93%, that, that's big dollars. So, okay. Um, and so... The, the big thing will be is, is at 
uh, second interim, I'll be bringing you a new projection with, with these, these lower attendance and enroll, uh, attendance percentages. So um, another thing within the budget, the new proposal uh, for 23-24 actually does have uh, the PERS rate. Um, remember, these are the uh, pension cost rates. This is the retirement for our, our certificated classified staff is PERS and STRS. And uh, originally uh, at adopted budget and at first interim, we were actually projecting the PERS rate to go down. Um, that is what we had, had uh, what was built into the, the projection systems. Um, however, uh, because of the rate of return on investment for PERS, um, they are actually projecting a rate increase now for 23-24, which is significant for us. That's a cost of uh, $400,000, and that's an ongoing cost. Once the rates increase, the, it continues to be an additional cost ongoing. Um, so that is something we have to keep an eye on. At this point, STRS doesn't have any rate increases. Um, they actually uh, aren't allowed to increase their rates for at least another couple of years. So they're, they're locked in unless the legislature takes action. So uh, we don't anticipate an increase in STRS, but STRS is in the same boat in the fact that when the stock market did poorly, the, the investment returns that are, are actually the majority of the income that come in for both of those agencies dropped. And so now they have to pick up that extra cost either through employee contributions or employer contributions. And so they're increasing the employer contribution. So that impacts us. So more or less that takes away dollars that would be available for salary increases, uh, programs, everything else. So that new money coming in, some of that's getting eaten up there. Another factor we have to keep an eye out is that minimum wage is continuing to increase. There is an automatic uh, increase now in the state uh, minimum wage. Um, and so we are anticipating it to go up to $16 an hour in 2024. So we need to monitor that. We will bring information to the board. That is something that's in the board policy. Um, and we are actually anticipating increases uh, for the next four years. And so up, up to over $17 an hour. Um, and so uh, that is something that will impact or potentially have some... <coughs> Uh, compression on our salary schedules depending on um, what that all looks like. And then the other big factor that we're looking at is just overall economic health. Uh, you, you, you see interest rates, uh, the, government, or the uh, Fed increased interest rates the other day another quarter of a percent. Um, that was lower than what ha they had been doing. So we're thinking inflation is maybe starting to slow down based off of those factors. Uh, for the state of California, we are heavily dependent upon um, personal income tax. And so we are really uh, questioning how with the stock market not making the returns and some of the other factors, what the state budget will look like in the next couple of years, um, because that will be the primary driver of whether or not the state has a deficit or a surplus. And the state does have a deficit and the state is not impacting education with that. So, I mean, we can say we're very happy with that fact, uh, but there are obviously impacts to a lot of other programs uh, within the state that will have cuts or reductions. Um, we do also have a rainy day fund, several uh, actual funds. We actually, I think there is a total of three funds that help protect the education budget. Um, the governor is not proposing the, to access any of those three funds, which is great. Um, and so, you know, we do feel like we have a, a little security blanket with the state budget, um, at least for the next few years, unless the economy goes significantly south or the state budget at least. So, so those are all things we're looking at as well. So a um, lot more information to come. Second interim will come to you guys in March. Um, so we'll have the revised information from this uh, in the multi-year projection for 23-24. So you'll get to see that. And we'll be also updating our current year budget to reflect uh, new expenditures. So, and I just talked through this slide before I even clicked on it. So that's a kind of the, the information with regards to next steps and where we are. Um, and then you get to see all the different activities that are budget and LCAP related. We are doing um, additional budget advisory committee meetings. We got the next one coming up in uh, end of this month in February. And then we also have the LCAP data walks that are happening right now uh, through different groups. And we're having uh, different organizations that we're meeting with on all of those. So any questions? Questions from the board? A couple very quickly. Sure. Uh, back on page four with the yeah. equity multiplier. I won't ask you to tell us how much money we'll get because it sounds like we have no idea right now. Right. But uh, you said in May we'll have likely have more information if we are going to get that for the two schools we're thinking we might. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when those funds do come in, would that kind of act just like our supplemental uh, site-specific funding that we just went through? Um, so it would go directly to that school. They would have the discretion to use it. I, the governor's proposal is that way. Yes. Okay. It, it would be exactly like that. It would be. It would be. They would actually. There's an additional section in the LCAP we would have to do. Um, their their school plans would obviously be updated. There's community input, uh, stakeholder input on all of those those dollars, um, and they are site directed. So yes. Yeah. Good. Oh, it sounds exciting if it happens. Yeah. Uh, 
And then you mentioned, um, I think it was with Prop 28, that that funding wouldn't be available at least till the following year with the um, equity multiplier. Would we anticipate that would be available the 23-24 school year? Uh, it would. So both both of them should have dollars in 23-24. The problem is, is if we don't have the language from CDE on what is an allowable activity, if we have to have a, a an, board approval plan before we can spend the money so often when those things happen until we we were kind of stuck until we have that information you kind of saw like educator effectiveness money that came we weren't even a to g grant money a lot of those pots we didn't even start bringing to the board until december january for the plan um, because it took that long to get the information from C and so we, to hire staff and do the things you need to do you don't normally want to be hiring in that time of year so right. Often implementation of the program in the first year of the dollars is not until the following year, or maybe there's just some upfront costs that we pay for. But yes, realistically, you're not going to see full implementation till 24, 25, probably on either of those okay. things. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And then last thing was on uh, slide six, we were talking about attendance. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this, but our attendance has been lower than in previous years. Um, I'm assuming that's consistent with pretty much every other district we're seeing. You know, I, I don't have actual numbers. Anecdotally, I can say that's the case based on the conversation I've had. Folsom Cordova is actually within Sacramento County area. We, we normally have one of the highest attendance rates. And so, yes, I, but we, you know, I, I think what we are definitely seeing and, you know, this is probably something with some of the reports we get from A2A and those things that we can maybe share with the board as, as how attendance is going. Um, we, I know we, we are starting back, like I said, we're, uh, uh, Scott and uh, Kate are starting back up the attendance task force. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna start having those meetings again because um, it's it's pretty much across the board. Everything where I'm hearing is, is the attendance rates are dropping. This may be the new normal, which, you know, what, what may happen as a, because the state actually funds on the attendance, if everybody's, attendance drops, what will happen is the proportion that the state has to provide is less dollars. Mm -hmm. So what we would hope in that scenario is the state would then maybe increase the base rate so that it offsets the ADA loss, but they may take it the money and run and, you know, fill somewhere else in the budget potentially. So, so that would be something that we would, you know, uh, uh, with regards to when we communicate out to, uh, you know, legislators and folks is that we, you know, we want to keep those dollars here. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any rush on me for this, but I, I mean, I would be curious to see what neighboring districts percentages are just so we know, it, you know, is there something different happening here, good or bad? Um, or is if it is consistent across the board, I mean, that, you know, I, I don't know. That doesn't change how we're addressing it, but it might be nice to know if there's any one specific thing. Sure. You got it. Any other questions? Comments from the audience? Any comments online? All right. Uh, back to the board. This is only discussion, so well, you will move to uh, the next item. Um, thank you, Sean, for that presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, the next item is a first read, Board Policy 6158 on Independent Study. Superintendent. Yes, the changes to this policy actually were discussed with the board prior to last school year per the recommendations from the state and AB 130 to make adjustments to independent study um, uh, to be a little bit more um, lenient in, in how we deal with independent study. So those, we brought it more in text narrative because CSBA had not made their sample policy yet and we needed to do it before the school year started. So. Board approved it prior to the beginning of 21-22, and then CSBA came out with the sample policy in August 2022, and it came to our attention in our quarterly updates that we missed bringing that policy back. So that's what you have in front of you with the edits, um, and the, the language that's reflected in the green highlights are the ones that we brought, back to, brought to the board um, prior to the beginning of the 21-22 school year. Um, but it was in narrative format, or we tried our best to add it into the policy, and now it's um, you know formalized here. So uh, no major changes. It uh, pretty much reflects that, and um, it did go to the policy subcommittee on January 9th for review as well. Any questions from the board? Comments from the public? Any comments online? All right, we're back to the board. Uh, again, this is just discussion. So uh, this will be back on the next agenda for approval? Yes, for under consent, if that's okay. agreeable. Sounds good. 
Uh, next, agenda item 13, information. And this one is information item. Um, and it was a request of our public at the last meeting to, to bring this presentation forward. This was the presentation that we shared at our um, <coughs> January uh, 7th study session um, per request of the board. So we were revisiting the reimagining Rancho Cordova initiatives and where we were at. So it was like a progress report on that, as well as an update on our community schools initiative up to that point. So we had Kate Hazarian and Carla Davis um, sharing that update. So the presentation itself, there's nothing that's changed. It's just making it available at a regular board meeting per the public's request at the last meeting. All right. Um, any questions, comments from the board? Uh, you know, one thing I, I will just, uh, um, uh, well, first of all, I, I very much enjoyed this uh, discussion uh, this year. I enjoyed the discussion on reimagining Rancho Cordova last year as well. So, um, uh, but it's just, I guess this is more of an observation when Kinney was here earlier. Um, it was noticeable how loud uh, the highway noise is from Kinney. Mm. And I know we've talked over the years about maybe finding a more suitable campus for Kinney uh, but, um, uh, and Prospect. Um, but, you know, I would, you know, honestly, I would find that immensely distracting, although I guess you would probably get used to it after a while. But you could hear it. You could hear the, the cars go whizzing by on the highway. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I, again, that was a wonderful presentation. So uh, this is just information, but uh, I will open up to the public if there's any comments. Could I just make one yeah. observation comment? Now, once you said that, I, I thought you were going somewhere else. And I, I, I feel like reimagining is sort of a negative connotation sometimes. And so seeing that is concerning to me, um, especially after the Kinney presentation today of how much pride and culture they have at their school. And, um, and so I don't know if we could possibly change that verbiage to be something more positive in the fact that we have amazing things that do go on at our Cordova schools. And um, I, while I appreciate all of the things in the presentation in terms of where we're going, um, but maybe it would be more of a roadmap for Rancho Cordova schools or, or something because I think that the word reimagining has this connotation that what's happening there isn't good and that's not at all the truth. And so um, when, I, when I first saw the, that at the, the meeting that we had, I had that same feeling and then today it was brought back, back, brought back up because the culture and the heart that is in those schools is so prevalent, not just with Kenny, but our teachers too that were here from Rancho Cordova. So um, I don't know if we want to kind of adjust that because I know it's something that we are going to be revisiting often. So I did like the language you just suggested, a roadmap for Rancho Cordova schools. That was off the cuff, so I don't but know I like if it. I would <laughs> stick with it, but. Yeah, no, it's a valid point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would like to say to I don't have my mic on. Um, being at informational nights l last week at both Mitchell and at Cordova High, um, when the students did their presentation, there were many parents that were very impressed with the education that was being brought forth at those schools. Um, the only comment that I would make is talking to multiple families. Um, not having a STEM pathway in Rancho Cordova schools is precluding some of our families from staying in Rancho Cordova and they are jumping to Sutter Middle School and to the Folsom schools. And so I think if we're going to really retain those families in Rancho Cordova that we really need to kind of set that as a major priority. And I know Dr. Hooper has discussed that, um, but I would say that based off my conversations, we need to make it sooner than later um, because the comment was had a great experience, Riverview STEM, <clears throat> I liked, liked what we saw at Mitchell, I liked what we saw at Cordova, but we're going to the parent nights at the other ones uh, because of the STEM options. Um, one parent even commented that she currently works at Costco and everything there is automated, that agriculture is automated and that we really need to be looking at bringing those STEM options. And so, you know, if we could maybe look at getting STEAM or STEM at Mills, I think particularly that would really like enhance that particular school and it would really give those kids a pathway to stay because I it's I, it breaks my heart to think that they can't stay in their community with their friends. Um, 
particularly I think at the middle school level because the comment was we actually like a lot of the programs that are Cordova High and we're not necessarily married to one of the schools in Folsom, but the relationships at the middle school are difficult to then transition into a brand new high school without those relationships. And so I think that, you know, we really need to kind of start, I know that we're, we're talking about community schools and the heavy load that is to implement that, but I do think that we're missing an opportunity if we don't kind of take action pretty quick on getting a STEAM or STEM initiated at that location. So that'd be my only comment on that. And Superintendent, that's something that's actively being worked on by staff currently, yeah, correct? Yeah, we're having those conversations for sure. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. All right. Uh, any comments from the public? Um, lot? No? All right, back to the board. It was just information, so you have that. Uh, let's see. We'll go to item 14, superintendent's report. Superintendent. Okay, well, today is February 2nd. We are actually in Black History Month, which started February 1st. Um, so it is National Black History Month, and we celebrate the contributions of black Americans who have made important contributions to our country and culture. Um, and in Folsom Cordova, we acknowledge and honor that rich cultural heritage and triumphs of African Americans throughout US history. And each of our schools are bringing attention and recognition in different ways. We celebrate our staff, we celebrate our students, um, the curriculum that you see displayed. Um, we, we make sure that that's um, honoring our culture and, and heritages of, of our African American um, students and families as well. So um, we want to pay homage to that. And then also this uh, next week, we're doing a Black Families United for Education evening to hear specifically from our Black families. Um, and this is in relationship to the um, community engagement piece of what we're doing for the community schools. Kate and Carla have done a lot of um, listening campaigns. And this campaign is specific for our African American families. It's at Cordova High School at five o'clock to seven o'clock. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with our LCAP community forums. And as you saw in Mr. Martin's presentation, we have several of those coming up. We had our first one with SAB yesterday, really appreciated the feedback, the input, the authenticity of what we're hearing from our students. Um, and, and I wanted to tie that into um, the speaker that we heard last night at the uh, SCOE trustees dinner. Um, his name is um, Matt Navo. He's the executive director of CCEE, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. And he was talking about the importance of community engagement and the difference between engagement from parents and community versus involvement. And I, I think those definitions really run, you know, hit home with me as I'm thinking about our listening campaigns for community schools, for our LCAP. And I think what our, our, our public needs to hear is, okay, we're sharing with you what, you know, what are the glows and what are the grows, what are our challenges and barriers, and what are you going to do about it? So it's that actionable piece that, you know, I think we need to commit to as we bring this information together and, and look at those trends and how do we resource up those biggest needs going forward. So um, looking forward to those, we invite our board to, to come to any and all of the LCAP uh, community forums if you would like. And um, then online registration started this week too for the 23-24 school year. We've got advertising going on. Um, if you see the Style Magazine, we've got a great ad advertising our district. Uh, we are advertising our educational options through In the Loop with the Soup this month. So um, our schools are all doing great things to um, get the word out there. So we want to make sure that our youngest families, our parents of TKers up through adult ed are um, getting involved with pre-registration. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next agenda item is uh, 15, board reports. I'll start with the students. Um, and you, you wanna go first? Yeah. Well, I'm thrilled to have Coach AD back at Cordova as our track and field coach. I remember having him as my track coach my sophomore year and he always goes above and beyond for our student athletes, ensuring connections while promoting a positive and fun atmosphere. So I'm excited to see him around and potentially join our track team again this year. I also wanted to express my sincerest gratitude to Principal Hyden at Cordova, who is always putting student needs on the uh, forefront and is dedicated to developing connections with us students during school on a daily basis. Um, and as well, thank you to our admin team and campus monitors for catering to our unique needs and always knowing how to professionally handle our challenges that we face as a whole. And that's all. Thank you. Board Member Shavasta. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I just wanted to say happy Black History Month, um, and I want to take a moment to recognize VISTA's Black Student Union, um, who is doing so much organizing and community service work. Um, they take so much initiative within um, our community, um, and they meet regularly, um, and I attend those meetings, and um, all the students are so committed. Um, so I just want to say I'm really proud of them. Um, and I also want to take a moment to mention some of the data that I've been talking about for years now. Um, there is a major disparity in rates of disciplinary action for Black youth in our district, um, which has lifelong impacts for those youth. Um, and I'm glad to see the progress we've made towards equity over the past couple of years. Um, but I'm really hoping that we'll take more divisive, or, excuse me, decisive action towards fighting against the school to prison pipeline in the coming years. Um, and I also want to remind all high school students, because I know enrollment season is, uh, is happening right now, um, to please consider enrolling in ethnic studies. Um, it's an amazing program. Um, and I'm really excited to see where we'll go with that program this coming school year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member Loft House. Um, I wanted to recognize that as FCUSD, the business of our business is educating our kids. So thank you to the teachers who came to share their experiences and passion for teaching our youngest students. I hope to come up with creative ways to ensure support for our students and teachers in our K-2 classrooms, and we'll ensure that the equity questions are used to guide all of the decisions we make. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Folsom Middle School's leadership class, and I am certain that we have future SAB um, student board members in that room. They are very active and very engaged in um, not only the growth of their school, but of the district as a whole. So that was very enjoyable. I also um, went to History Day that was hosted at Theater Judah. It brought me back to my History Day days, um, <laughs> which weren't always all that positive because of how much time and effort and energy. So I recognize all of the time and effort and energy that the teachers, the students, and all of the volunteers that were there um, to help carry that out. And I look forward to see their success at County uh, History Day next month. And then I also wanted to say congratulations to Mr. Clark um, on his ratification as the African-American director at large for CSBA. I, it's very much deserved and look forward to your leadership there as well as FCUSD's representation at the state level. A round of applause. Thank you. Uh, board Member Clark. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lofthouse, for that uh, congratulatory message. Um, just a couple of things. Happy Black History Month. I actually look forward to attending the uh, Black Family United uh, event next Monday. Um, also, there is a Black History and Beyond event that I would encourage everyone to attend. It's the first in Rancho Cordova. Uh, that will happen Friday, February 10th um, from 7 to 8.30, of course, on, uh, there will be a mixer for our VIPs uh, from 6 to 7. Uh, so I hope to see you out there. It should be a, a pretty fun evening. Um, past two weeks, I've had the opportunity to visit Williamson, uh, Kinney, uh, to connect with those students um, and Cordova a couple of times. Um, but yeah, sh truly enjoyed my visits. And um, oh, and look forward to seeing you all at the uh, Parent Summit, I believe, is Saturday um, yeah. at 8 o'clock or 8.30. 8.30. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, let's see, um, Ms. Lorette. Um, happy Black History Month and uh, congratulations to Mr. Clark. Um, I also wanted to thank our students who were actually helping at the Parent Information Nights. Um, they were very integral at the uh, tables and being very enthusiastic. So they're definitely our best ambassadors of representing our schools. Um, went to the Strings concert last night for Cordova, Mills and Mitchell and wanted to congratulate Mr. Adams, Mr. Sims and Mr. McCrossan for a fabulous performance and just wanted to thank the district for continuing to fund the arts and we are very lucky to be able to have such a robust music program and arts program at our schools and it really is an integral part to our kids education and as a parent of music students, I um, was very enthusiastic to see the kids all playing together from the high school all the way to the very beginners and um, being able to see 
200 plus kids on a stage is pretty impressive, especially when you look at the surrounding districts that don't offer that. So did want to thank all the staff and past boards that have continued to fund our arts and make, making sure that that's available to our students. So. Thank you. Uh, board member Huey. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I just want to take a, a, a minute to kind of recognize really like the, the heaviness that's been these last few weeks. Um, I think that was represented certainly with some of the stories in this room for the teachers, but, uh, you know, as, as a district, we've had two deaths, one of a student, one of a former student, uh, recently. And, uh, so just acknowledge that it's hard and, uh, want to make a special thank you to our mental health team that have been, uh, really impressive with the, uh, just being ready to serve and to, uh, you know, be with our students and our staff, um, times of crisis and urgency are not easy. And uh, those are uh, some impressive people that have been helping out. So um, acknowledging that heaviness in the midst of, of course, lots of lots of joy. Um, it's always kind of hand in hand together. So uh, as we move on together, I hope that we can hold both of those together. All right, thank you. Uh, I also would like to uh, just quickly congratulate Mr. Clark as well on being on the board of directors of uh, California School Boards Association. Uh, it's quite an honor. In fact, uh, I'm not sure. I wonder if we have ever had a, a board member on the California board before. It may be the first. Yeah. Nope. So you're the first. That's awesome. Congratulations. Um, Right <laughs> <laughs> it is a little chilly in here today. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm going to uh, just take this opportunity to you know, pick up where I uh, left off a couple of meetings ago on highlighting some issues that I'm concerned about relating the, uh, the failing of, of young males in our society. Uh, this, um, uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this. I'm not going to read all of it uh, because some of the statistics I've already touched on in other articles, but this is a USA Today article that highlights the fact that um, uh, data supports the claim that boys are falling behind and dramatically so. Uh, they point to a Brookings Institution study that shows that 88% of uh, girls graduate on time compared to 82% of boys goes on to talk about the college enrollment gap uh, where 60% of uh, college enrolled students are, are women and only 40% are men uh, uh, in referencing the National Student Clearinghouse study. Um, it goes on to talk about how college enrollment in the United States has declined by 1.5 million students over the past five years with men accounting for 71% of that, that, that decline. Um, uh, let's see, uh, let's get that one, let's see. Uh, it goes on to talk about uh, the lack of male role models in our schools. Uh, it indicates that only 24% of our K-12 teachers are men, uh, uh, citing the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, and actually the next couple of paragraphs I might read just simply says, the structure and climate of our, in our schools are equally important influencers when it comes to s scholastic success for young men. A uh, major 2015 study which uh, collected data from nearly 5,000 subjects concluded that school environments may be attuned to feminine type personalities, uh, making it generally easier for girls to achieve better grades in school. A 2016 report from the American Socio Soci Sociological Association concluded that the way teachers respond to boys' behaviors plays a significant role in shaping their educational outcomes years later. The study found that elementary school boys had much greater exposure to negative school environments uh, compared with girls. In high, uh, and in high school, boys reported significantly higher rates of grade repetition and lower educational expectation. Um, given that boys are more likely uh, to be held back and punished, it's easy to understand why teachers might approach male students with certain unconscious biases, which may translate into self-fulfilling outcomes. 
Uh, imagine being bombarded with a constant chorus of pay attention, stop fidgeting, don't touch that. Um, uh, yet that's what, our, what many of our boys experience in schools every day. Um, and then it does go down uh, and, and talks about um, you know, uh, what we know about uh, introducing lesson plans through uh, dramatic points that, and that uh, uh, grab their attention. We know that boys are more, uh, that's an unfortunate word, kinesthetic. Thank you, kinesthetic. Uh, learners who, uh, who benefit from hands-on activities where they learn by touch, exploration, and manipulation. The absence of these opportunities, uh, especially during the pandemic when so many students were learning online, has had considerable impact on educational uh, advances, especially for boys. Um, uh, and then it, it just um, actually, interesting point, it says uh, that in not that I don't think there are very many of these, but in all uh, boys' schools um, that are teaching uh, education that's, I guess, uh, attuned to, to boys, the boys are thriving. Um, uh, not suggesting we need single-sex schools, but anyway. Uh, that's that's uh, just kind of a little um, a snippet there. Again, some of those statistics I had read uh, in prior articles um, and then this is just uh, actually something that I thought was maybe ironic or um, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but uh, today uh, Sacramento County launched uh, a new commission uh, for, uh, for women and girls. It's called the Commission on Women and Girls. And it goes on to, in the, the study to indicate that, you know, a majority of our mayors in Sacramento County are women, that we have all women um, uh, city council in West Sacramento. Um, uh, and basically goes on to talk about how women are thriving in society. And that's wonderful. That's what we wanted. That's, that was the problem in the 1980s we needed to correct for. Where's the commission on, for boys? Where's the task force on boys? Why, as a society, do we not recognize we have a major problem on our hands, yet we're creating uh, you know, commissions and, and, and celebrating the success of women and girls, which truly is worth celebrating, but we're not recognizing that we have a crisis, a crisis with our boy population. I know people often point to, to pay gaps. You know, there is, a, and, and they're legitimately so. There has been a pay gap. But do you know in age 35 and under, there is a pay gap. It's on the men's side, not the women's side. Women are out earning men. And I, not meant to be a competition. My point is, with all of these statistics that are out there in multiple articles, we are doing little to nothing as a society and I really want to know what we're going to do as a school district to help our, our boys thrive just as much as our girls. So that's my comment for tonight. Uh, let's move on to advanced planning. Uh, so agenda item 16. Uh, our next board meeting is February 16th, uh, 2023. Um, our 12-month board calendar uh, is available there for your reference. Uh, suggested future agenda items, uh, we have that. So uh, any suggested future agenda items? Um, I do have uh, one suggested future agenda item. Um, I'd like for the board to um, have a discussion about adding a new leadership position to the, the board. Um, uh, I am interested in, in you know, seeing if the board would be interested in creating the position of historian. Um, you know, this uh, district is rich with um, history. It's rich with um, uh, success stories. Uh, and, you know, often when asking questions, uh, well, like, you know, tonight, you know, whether uh, board member Clark was the first uh, um, uh, board member from FCUSD on the, the state board, we knew the answer, but oftentimes when I ask a historical question, I'm like, 
Well, we have that somewhere. It's in a filing cabinet or we have a closet upstairs and we could probably find that out. It, um, you know, when we at, get asked questions about the history of the district and when it was created and the like, we have it somewhere, it's, it's in, uh, but it, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, you know readily available. Um, we recently, I, I had an opportunity to, um, uh, I was reached out by the, the uh, Folsom Historical Society who wanted to meet with me and and I was thinking to myself uh, it was a great conversation but I was like you know if we had someone on the board who was identified as a uh, board historian historian you know that would be a great opportunity for that individual to liaison with the Ranch Cordova Historical Society with the Folsom Historical Society um, uh, as well as you know perhaps um, compiling or overseeing the compiling of information that uh, of our rich history. I mean, we even were surprised as a district when the new district attorney reached out to us to wanting to do an interview at Cordova High School, um, uh, being that he graduated from there, and we literally didn't know that he graduated from Cordova High School. Even though he's our first African-American district attorney, we had no idea. And these are lost opportunities. And you know, I'm sure there are many things we could do with the role of a board historian. And I thought that maybe that might be a topic that we might, um, we might consider uh, at a future uh, board meeting so we could have a discussion. So I guess uh, to see if there's a consensus on whether um, folks would be interested in having that conversation. One quick question, is that an appointed position or? Yeah, it would be a, a yeah, it would be a board appointed position um, that would occur once a year. Yeah. In my mind, at least. I'm just trying to figure out how that would work if it's rotating every year. Is it like keeping track of? I mean, we have the Folsom Historic uh, Committee already, and I think they're pretty versed in what's going on in the schools. Um, you know. I, I don't know if it would be worth our time to actually uh, explore this, but uh, you know, it depends on the rest of the board. I mean, I, this is something new to me. I've, I've never heard anything um, like that before. I've heard it in associations, and um, I think uh, Linda Budge with the city of Rancho Cordova is kind of like their you know, city historian, but I've never heard of anything being like that on the board. Um, so, so we'll be breaking new ground. Yeah, it's worth the discussion, I guess. No. Okay. Yeah, I'd be up for discussing it. I mean, I think one thing with having Mr. Short off the board that you did lose was a lot of knowledge from 20 years. So, you know, I mean, having that stuff memorialized might be a good, good thing. I'm open to discussion for sure. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to figure out if, if that does make sense, but if we want to have a discussion about it, that's great. I'm fine with the discussion. I, I question the, the things that were presented today as a role of that is more of almost like a committee rather than like a historical committee rather than a board position, but I think that would all come up in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it could be structured in many different ways. Um, and, and maybe there is a committee uh, that's part of it as well. So, um, all right, so we have a, a consensus to at least uh, put that on our future agenda. Uh, anything else? All right. Uh, we handled all of <coughs> our closed session business uh, in the first. Uh, um, Mr. President, I'm sorry. Um, I was looking at the IYT, um, and I've been pushing for this with the Project 1300 uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. it, look, it looks like we've gone from winter, um, okay, February, and then what's the June 15th, 2023? Just curious. It looks like it'll be on the 16th, but. Right, and I'm gonna have Dr. Huber give a little bit of definition because we needed clarification too and spoke with um, Michael to get that clarification. Yeah, so this was um, in kind of direct response to your inquiries before, um, Mr. Clark. And so the 
um, presentation, if you will, on February 16th is kind of an overview of some of the partnerships. Because when we originally, when you had brought it up, you had brought up Black Child Legacy. Mm -hmm. And then we discovered that actually we don't, we're not working with them currently in the district. So we wanted to update in terms of the, the partnerships we currently have. Um, part of that is also IYT, um, Earth Mama, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then also you were inquiring about the 1300 pro, um, campaign. So we wanted to bring some information back to the board regarding that as well. So that will be the information that's shared at the next board meeting. The IYT meeting in June, or not meeting, the IYT um, update is the same update that they did last year. So they come at the end of the year to give all that data in terms of how is that program going and, and how are students being impacted is kind of part of our... Um, uh, Annual. Yes, thank you. Annual progress Groping. report. <laughs> yes, the progress report in terms of our vital signs. Okay, I mean, I, I asked for a resolution uh, probably about four or five months ago. It looks like that's been crossed off. Um, Project 1300 is important, uh, especially important for our men of color. Um, kind of helps them get into the UCs a little bit easier. Um, so I'm just kind of questioning, why not a resolution? Is that something that the board didn't decide on doing? Or I mean, what I is think it? what we learned um, and and we weren't sure what the resolution entailed either. So I was asked to contact some of the other you know, superintendents that have had IYT in their district for a while. What we learned is that they've been involved with IYT for a period of time mm -hmm. and <clears throat> the commitment and their progress that they see then, it, it went hand in hand with the 1300 campaign. But we were, we were still at the beginning stages last May, I think when we were approached about it and mm -hmm. we were just giving our first um, delivery of, of data from one year and coming out of the pandemic, we were kind of behind a year with that information and I think with implementation too. So we wanted a full year <laughs> in as close to a regular year as possible of implementing IYT and to look at the vital signs of that data again and then um, get on board with that 1300 campaign that we have the data to support that you know we're all in because I think we're gonna go into year, is it year four next year of the contract with IYT? Year three. Year three. Year three. Okay. Okay. I'm just curious. I mean, Twin Rivers has a resolution. Natomas does. I think Elk Grove does. Mm -hmm. I think Sac can we get, City does. Can we get a copy of what they have? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they send sure. us a copy too. Okay. Yeah, because I had asked for a copy. But they've been involved, I believe, longer than we have. Yeah, and, and that's the purpose of the next board meeting's presentation is to share that information regarding the 1300 campaign with the entire board so that the entire board has that information. All right, uh, as I uh, was mentioning, uh, we handled all of our closed session uh, business in the, uh, this, uh, the five o'clock session, so we do not need to go back into closed session. So uh, that takes us to agenda item 21, adjournment. Uh, so we will adjourn by unanimous consent unless uh, there's any objections. Hearing no objections, we are adjourned.